Okay. We'll call the meeting of uh, June 24th, Dark County Board of Supervisors to order, and we'll all rise to put the lead. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Here. We got a new person at the helm. Helm here, so we'll see how it works. Okay, wait a minute. Are we ready? Uh -oh. No. No. She we all there. She didn't hit it that <clears throat> I guess we can keep pushing it. Oh my God. It's great. We run into problems today. We're going to divert the voice. All right, we're good right. to go. We're good to go on the roll call. Yes. There you go. I hit it already. Yes. I hit it once. There we go. Okay, there's 20 present, one absent. Um, presentation of the agenda. So moved. Motion by Miller, seconded Second. by Chuck Brand. <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 We're going to deviate from the agenda quite a bit today. Um, we're going to go through correspondence, then we're going to go to the public comment, and we're going to split the com public comment into two uh, separate issues. <coughs> we're going to take public comment on everything but the cave, and then Dr. Raffin is going to speak, and the uh, person from the tower is going to speak, and then we're going to have public comment on the cave, and then go to the cave report. Does everybody understand that? And then we'll mm -hmm. go into the rest of the um, county board agenda. So. Uh, We'll cover correspondence right now. Is uh, in your packet are two, the unassigned fund balance and a letter from Ann Crow on uh, a tower reception that has been turned over to the IS committee to look into. Uh, so we'll go to public comment. Does anybody in the public want to comment on something other than the cave? If not, I don't see anybody coming forward. So we'll call on the doctor to give us a speech on NWTC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for giving me a few minutes. I understand you have a very busy agenda, so I will take only as long as you want to ask questions after I make my few comments. Um, I have put in front of you a packet. There's lots of information in there. Um, uh, your, the good thing is, is I'm not going to read it all to you. Um, I'm just going to speak a little bit to what our priorities are in the coming year and a little bit on the budget. Uh, we've had a very good year, um, the year ending, of course, in June 30, uh, serving over um, 40,000 people, 7,000 uh, full-time equivalent students. Uh, one of the things that we've really been focusing on for the last five years is making sure that our students are successful, uh, as opposed to just letting them come into the college and then, you know, hopefully they do the best that they can in the college, and if they don't do so hot, they just drop out. We've taken it to say, look, at every student that comes here, or even if they don't originally come for a degree, really needs to get a degree or a credential. Because we know when we look at it statistically that the first time in which you have a demographic group that exceeds the national median in wage and exceeds the national median in terms of employment um, is when you have a degree in higher education, either a one or a two year degree. So we feel quite literally that if we are not successful with our students, we may very well be condemning them to a life of poverty. <coughs> We want to make sure that they have a family living wage. And to that extent, we have introduced a number of support services to these students, and we've been able to attract a number of significant grants uh, for these students. Um, we've basically been able to increase our tutoring, increase our academic coaching, increase what we're bring, bringing available in terms of counseling. Um, we have a partnership with Goodwill providing financial literacy counseling. Uh, we have an emergency fund. Uh, the average uh, amount of money that a student typically needs out of an emergency fund 
is about $500, and that's oftentimes all that stands between them being able to complete their program and not being able to complete their program. Uh, the grant that we received um, from the federal government basically gave us $150,000 towards an endowment to pay uh, for those fees as long as we matched it with $150,000. So we have our um, foundation is out raising that additional $150,000 and we're making good progress. So we'll have a 300,000 endowment from which we can use to support our students. I think we know we're in pretty good company or that we're doing a fairly good job when we were identified this past year as one of the four national finalists by the American Association of Community Colleges for Student Success. And we have been identified twice by the Aspen Institute for our student success. We are in the 85th percent or 95th percentile in terms of student success. But that, of course, is not going to be enough if we, don't just, if we don't keep working at it. So we introduced this past year, and we will be further developing an early alert system um, that basically within the first four weeks identifies, helps us identify students who are in trouble or are at risk of not being successful. Uh, oftentimes, students wait till the last minute uh, before they come for help, thinking they can do it on their own. Unfortunately, if you come to see us in the last two or three weeks and you've been doing poorly in class, it's a pretty deep hole. You really can't get out of it. So our goal is, is to reach out to these students and bring them in. Of course, we remain focused on developing and uh, continuing programs that provide for a skilled workforce. Uh, one of the areas uh, that we uh, started this past January was in the area of health and wellness and chronic disease management, knowing that uh, what's happening in the health industry is trying to keep people out of acute care facilities. Baby boomers do not want to go into assisted living. They don't want to be, in, they want to be independent. And so that more and more home care is needed, more and more chronic disease management is needed. Uh, we managed to build a fourth floor on the Green Bay campus, and we were able, our foundation raised $1.1 million um, uh, from the general, um, from various donors in order to be able to do that. Um, we will also uh, start a software development program uh, this coming year. Uh, we have uh, an environmental wastewater and water treatment program uh, that also started this year. So uh, we continue to look for what's happening down the road and what's happening in the future as we uh, look at our programming. We've done a lot of, of work with high schools, um, a lot of work particularly in rural areas, establishing, as you probably remember, last year I talked about our mobile trailer. Uh, for com computerized numerical control. We also now have a mobile trailer that's under construction for electromechanical that we'll be able to take out to the various schools and we have also one in the smart grid. We managed to attract a grant from the National Science Foundation that will allow us to take the smart grid trailer out uh, to various high schools in order to provide information uh, and career exploration in the utilities fields uh, for students um, that will be paid for out of that grant over the next uh, three years. We continue to develop uh, academies uh, across um, the various school districts and of course we will continue to do that and work with that in this area as well. The, um, <clears throat> so those are just a few of the things that we do. Uh, we're actually having a very good year, or uh, had a good year in Sturgeon Bay, um, having, um, after a few years of declining enrollment, actually having increased enrollment over this, over this past year, uh, serving over um, about 1,700 students, uh, primarily in nursing, diesel, and business management. Um, but welding has really come back. We're doing a lot of work with Bay Ship right now in terms of providing training and education for welders there. So uh, we hope to continue to see that grow as well. Lastly, I'll just speak briefly about the operational budget. And the point that I'll make to you is, um, you know, please remember that what has happened over the course of the last few years is, is that the state government, the legislature, and the governor have essentially frozen our ability to raise the property taxes. I know that saddens a great many of you. Um, I know you can laugh, that's okay, I know you. <laughs> but anyways, to raise the uh, uh, property tax. We are limited to raising the property tax uh, for our operational budget by the value of new construction. Uh, pretty much similar to what the restrictions are uh, on the county uh, and the municipalities. 
Um, so there has not been a lot of increase there. Now we are able to continue to issue debt and we could be raising our debt uh, structure, but we have, our board has taken the position uh, to try to manage within the existing debt levy that we have and not raise the debt levy. And I'm glad to say that they just passed the budget where they will not be raising the debt levy uh, again for I think the fourth year in a row. So we do not expect other than what the value of new construction is much of an increase. You actually will see no increase because the other thing that happened with the budget surplus, you probably read about it, was is that they swapped a state money for property tax money. Um, so we didn't get additional money, but essentially what they did uh, down in the legislature is, is that they took um, money about, in our case, it's pro approximately $30 million, and they took that amount of money and replaced from the property taxes and replaced it with state funds. Um, that means that your property tax bill in this coming year will probably be slightly less than half of what it was uh, in the prior years. We went from about 8% state funded to 42% state funded. Um, actually, I think that's a good thing. I mean, I think that that brings a much greater balance uh, for what we need to have and yet at the same time keeps us honest and focused on meeting local needs and maintains the local control and like local flexibility I think are important for us to be able to respond to needs as they arise. Um, there is a study committee right now that's looking at whether or not they want to set us up more like the university system. Personally, as you can expect, I think that that's a bad idea. Um, I think that we've got property taxes well under control and we've reduced them significantly and the, what we would lose in terms of flexibility for the communities um, and the control from communities would be bad. Um, so this is what we expect will be happening over the course of this next year as well as we um, develop the, as we continue our student success initiatives. Um, and I would be glad to uh, take any comment or any questions that you might have. Has anybody got any questions? Go ahead, Don. Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious to know, you said you have 1,700 students this year you're talking about? In Sturgeon Bay campus. Okay. We have 40,000 overall on our, in our, our campus. I understand. Uh, so what is the uh, projection for future years? And what, what was the low and what is the high of, uh, as the number of students over the years? Um, well, I don't have them going that far back. Um, we were as mm -hmm. high as during the midst of the recession, about 2,600. Um, we expect that we will uh, recover that probably in the next two to three years. What we have seen is this year, or last year, bottomed out in terms of the numbers of credit students and the number of credit students are beginning to rise. Um, so um, we are right now in a process of looking for over the next five year period of what, what do we need in terms of capacity and how are we going to adjust to, and meet that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? A little different this year sometimes, huh? And that cave must be really interesting. <laughs> so, good, good luck. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item we will bring forward the um, fiber to public safety tower. I see they just walked in. Tim, you want to come forward, and bring them up here, and then explain what this is all about? Come up to the podium, of course. I don't think it makes any difference for 30, 15 seconds ahead or 15 minutes ahead. Go ahead, Tim. Come on up. Um, thanks for having us today. Um, we're talking today about the capital improvement plan for fiber for public safety. Um, again, we've had this discussion already at the information systems committee level, uh, finance committee level, and then we basically uh, will be providing it in your <coughs> July packet for approval. So today it's just for information only, all right? A while ago, um, some of you have been on this board long enough to understand our history with fiber build in Door County. If you recall the news media on the Brilliant Cities build roughly in 2008. Um, I worked with Bruce Rowell who's here today to design that fiber network back then and basically at that time we asked for 165 buildings, municipal buildings, school district buildings to be hooked up with fiber. Of course as you know in 2008 the economy collapsed and that project did not go forward. All right. 
In the meantime, since that period of time, we've been building fiber for the county. All right, so various individual buildings have been hooked up. One of those, we work with Ensite, and we basically have hooked up the airport now with fiber. All right, the other build that we built was between the government center and the justice center. We built our own county fiber with Ensite and got the underwater crossing for that. And that provides us with redundancy to the charter fiber. So we have two ways to connect those two buildings together, our two core data centers that run everything for the county. At this point, uh, we had an opportunity, um, as Ensite continues to build in the county, to build both south and north to our public safety towers. And with that, we brought that forward to Marine and to Shirley and shared the numbers. Um, and I worked with Bruce Rowell from Access Engineering. I'm sorry, I should introduce these. That's Bruce Rowell from Access Engineering and Lee Thibodeau from Ensite. And uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, Lee to talk a little bit about his design today. But at that point, because Ensite was building fiber in the county north, and the county has a working relationship with Ensite Cellcom already, if you didn't know, we already currently use five of their towers. Bailey's Harbor, we plan to use in this build out with FEMA, but we already use Fish Creek, Jacksonport, um, Washington Island, Chambers Island, and we hope to have Bailey's Harbor added. There's five towers that they're already owned that we already have our public safety radio gear on. So we thought it was a good fit. But to be fair, we went out and ran a request for information with Charter and with AT&T, both companies uh, with Bruce Rowell, said that they can provide fiber optic circuits in Door County, <coughs> or fiber optic interconnectivity. Three questions were asked. Could you sell us dark fiber? to get from the government center or the justice center to that site directly? Could you lease us fiber services at one gigabit services? Or do you have some other option for six strands of dark fiber? Ensite was the only company that came back and could provide all sites that we asked for in the RFI with six strands of dark fiber for 25 years. They do so in what's referred to as an indefeasible right to use. It's a long-term lease to use that fiber to interconnect your buildings. That's kind of the basics of it without getting really long-winded. Um, so what I'd like to do, if Barb can throw up the map, uh, Barb, I also just put a PDF in there that's called 2014, if you can go back out to that other. Let me just grab one other thing. I'll just show you the buildings that we're going to get interconnected to in that uh, public drive for county clerk. County Board, and if we slide down to, there should be a PDF map in there. Yep, right there. When we put the RFI out on the street, um, we asked for these buildings to be hooked, and when we, at the last minute, Bruce Rowell mentioned that we should probably look at what we could do to interconnect the school buildings, the high school buildings that are on the land. So those who represent Washington Island, I'm sorry we weren't going to look at running fiber across to the island. But at this point, you can kind of see what's really at the top of this map is all of the public safety sites are represented by a little tower and then of course some of the school buildings north. And then if you go to the south, basically um, as you slide down in that drawing, we would show you that the Brussels Hill southwest and uh, the Mill Road Quarry or the Andrews Quarry sites. Um, so this is the map that basically all of the uh, vendors got and at this time um, again, Ensite was the only company at this time that could run fiber to all of those sites. Um, just so you know, AT&T could only run to two sites, and I believe Charter, again, it's, it's based off of the territory that they currently serve. Charter could only hit six or seven of the sites. So, again, um, both, all three vendors, by the way, said no way would we sell you fiber. They would not sell the fiber outright and just let us have it. Even if they had it, they wouldn't sell it outright. So, AT&T and Charter provided managed service. That means that all of our network traffic would have to go through their network and come back to us. When we talk about dark fiber, we're talking about we put our own electronics on the end of that fiber and run our own stuff on that. The reason we included the school districts is that, again, as the legislation down in Madison continues to shrink budgets, they have to share resources. Just like we do now with the city of Sturgeon Bay and with the village of Sister Bay. They come to us as a local resource for technical services. And when they do that, 
we prefer, the county prefers to be connected to them via fiber. It's a highly reliable circuit. So that's what we're talking about. And now you can put up the maps, I'm sorry, and I'll let Lee talk about it. So you know, um, we were, uh, by the time we get all done with Insight, in the CIP of next month, you'll see a project for, this project is $2.7 million. So it's no small potatoes. It's a big deal for us. It's a big deal for public safety, and it's a big deal for the county to be able to extend its fiber up north and down south. Okay? With that in mind, I'll let Lee uh, Thibodeau talk a little bit about Ensite and his company. There's a little bit of confusion between Ensite and Cellcom. I'll let him clarify that for you. And then talk over what his project plans are for the next couple of years as far as where they're building and what they're doing. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first off, thank you for your time and attention this morning and for giving us the opportunity to come and talk with you. By a quick way of background, Tim mentioned my name is Lee Thibodeau. I'm the director of networking with Ensight in Green Bay. Um, personal background, I'm a native of the area. I grew up in Luxembourg, lived in Green Bay now for about the last 40 years, and been in the telecommunications business for uh, a little bit over 35 years with a number of different uh, regional uh, companies. I've been with Ensight for about six and a half years in this role as director of networking. Uh, within my team, our responsibilities include all of our outside plants, so any cable that gets built and so forth, managing the construction projects uh, within my team. We provide all the transport, the optics and electronics to light the fiber that we put in the ground. Uh, then we operate it, so the field forces and the people you see driving around in the cell common inside trucks, uh, servicing our cell sites and so forth, uh, reporting to my team. And we also manage the cost of all that through our network development team, so we have a fairly broad responsibility. Uh, at, a, at its simplest, uh, my team connects our towers to our, to our uh, uh, switching center in Green Bay. Um, and and uh, so that's kind of what we do. I use the term Cellcom and Insight interchangeably. Uh, Cellcom is the most recognizable part of our business. It's the wireless business. Uh, we think of uh, Cellcom as our wireless brand. Insight is our corporate entity. Uh, I report into the corporate engineering department. We service all of the Insight properties, the wireless companies, the telephone companies we own, and so forth. So we service all of that from the corporate engineering department. So when you hear the term Cellcom and Insight, I use those interchangeably, and I'll apologize in advance for doing that. Uh, <clears throat> when you pick up the newspaper, turn on the TV, turn on the radio these days, all you hear about is 4G and LTE. Uh, it's a transformation of the wireless business, and what it means to the user is speed. Uh, a cellular telephone is no longer a, cell a telephone. It's a wireless device that people want to do everything with, including watch movies. Uh, and all that demands uh, greater capacity to our cell towers. So uh, to accommodate that and, and to build out our network and serve our, the communities that we're, where we do business, we have to have... Um, bigger capacity networks to those sites. And that's really what's driving the fiber optic project, particularly here in Door County, but across our entire network. Uh, in the past uh, several years, uh, we have built um, to the point where our company owns a little over 1,200 miles of its own fiber right now, and another 1,200 miles or so that we have acquired from other carriers. So we're big time in the, in the fiber business. Uh, specifically to Door County, I brought a couple of maps along that I wanted to share with you about what we're doing in terms of fiber optics. Um, I brought a, a laser pointer along, so I'm going to see if that will work to, uh, to reach. We've, the first map I have up is a map of Southern Door County uh, to, to kind of set the stage. Uh, starting in about 2009, we began the design of the network to attack Door County. And the first part of it was getting fiber between Green Bay and Sturgeon Bay. So in, in uh, 2009, we began, began designing and in 2011 constructed a route that runs along the Bay Shore uh, through Dykesville, um, up through Brussels, and into Sturgeon Bay. We created two routes across Sturgeon Bay, one directly through downtown, one loops through the business park on the west side. Am I getting the right? I apologize in advance. I have grown up thinking of Door County as north and south and uh, was corrected recently that it's really east and west, so I'll apologize for that in advance. That route was completed, uh, lit, touches all of our cell sites at places like New Franken, 
uh, one out near the Club Chalet, Dykesville over in Lincoln, uh, Little Sturgeon, uh, Brussels and so forth on into Sturgeon <coughs> Bay. To create diversity and to hit additional <coughs> cell sites, we're currently building a route that starts down here at Denmark and runs through uh, Pilsen up to Luxembourg, uh, from Luxembourg over to Algoma, through Casco to Algoma, and from Algoma into Sturgeon Bay. Parts of that are complete. We're just about finished with construction between Denmark and Luxembourg. Uh, we have started construction between Algoma and Sturgeon Bay and we'll begin shortly between Luxembourg and Algoma. So th those segments will all be finished uh, and lit <coughs> this year. What that will do for us, it not only connects us to additional cell sites in both Kiwani and Door County, but it creates a ring so that we have a very reliable network should we have a cut or a, um, uh, the cable get cut along the way it will reverse and route uh, without losing uh, connectivity. So that's kind of where we are at in the southern part of Door County. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll have that ring active and uh, between Green Bay and, and Sturgeon Bay, we'll be completely ringed and all of our cell sites connected there. Uh, I should, uh, Tim mentioned uh, the co-location of towers. Uh, we are right next to the county at Brussels uh, and I have worked with uh, uh, the, the one that's contemplated at Anders, uh, we worked, worked on a design for that that uh, we've developed as well. If you could jump ahead to the next map, please. There. This is uh, where we are at in uh, the northern part of Door County, or I guess the eastern part of Door County. Uh, <laughs> you see uh, a number of uh, uh, dashed and solid red lines here indicating what's been built and what is, un and what is uh, planned. So if we start uh, at our, uh, just north of Sturgeon Bay at what we call our Meyer site, Ken Meyer site just on the on outside of Sturgeon Bay, our fiber runs from there uh, up to our uh, tower at uh, Highway HH and then over to uh, Valmy. Uh, the route, we, we just completed construction between uh, Meyer and HH. That route is being spliced and lit right now. Uh, we also have fiber completed from our site at Horseshoe Bay into Egg Harbor. Uh, and then we have the route between Ephraim and our tower just east of Ephraim. About, there's a site about three miles east of there. That's complete and operational, as is the route from um, Sister Bay through Ellison Bay to Gills Rock is complete and operational. Those were completed uh, in 2012 uh, and turned up and, and working right now. Uh, we are just about to con start construction between Fish Creek and Bailey's Harbor. Uh, that route has been designed and permitted and uh, we just signed the construction contracts to begin that this year. That will be finished before the end of this year uh, to, to build that <coughs> segment. So what we're starting to do is fill in the gaps there. Uh, and all these sites here, and I know that map looks kind of zigzags across the peninsula, but basically it connects all of our cell sites. And when complete, it will be a contiguous route from uh, Gills Rock all the way back to Sturgeon Bay where it'll, it'll meet that ring that I described on the previous map. Uh, the, where we are at on the remainder of the routes, uh, the route from uh, HH to Valmy is uh, designed. Uh, we hold most of the permits for construction there. We have not gone to bid with that yet. Um, uh, that one remains uh, uh, subject to budgetary funding. Uh, from from uh, Valmy to uh, Jacksonport, uh, same thing, we are uh, designed and nearly completely permitted there. The route across from, uh, from uh, Jackson Port up to connect to at uh, uh, Horseshoe Bay is designed, although we have to make some changes there. Uh, when we get near the golf course, we have to do a couple of redesign points. Uh, and that is the one that is closest to your Sunny Slope um, uh, facility. Uh, the next route is from, from Egg Harbor to Bailey's Harbor. Uh, which is designed but no permits in hand or anything like that. Uh, Bailey's Harbor, Fish Creek, I mentioned we're about to start construction. Fish Creek into Ephraim, uh, we have some design work done, but that has to require some work yet. And then the final segment that would run from uh, our Ephraim East site into Sister Bay uh, is just, we're doing some design work on that now. So uh, the remaining segments, when we started the project, we built, uh, broke the, northern part of the peninsula into uh, 12 segments. Uh, five were complete in 2012. Another one was complete in 2013. One's being built right now in 14. So there are five segments remaining. Uh, our plan is to complete those um, over the next several years. 
depending upon funding, obviously uh, a good deal of capital has to go into this on our part and it's all subject to board of director approval and we're going through the budgetary process right now. Um, we have, uh, as Tim mentioned, we've worked with the county on a number of projects. Uh, a couple of years ago we built fiber to uh, the airport and provided fiber out there for, to the county. Uh, the county co-locates on a number of our towers throughout the, throughout the county and as we build this we will be connected to those towers at, I, I can't think of all of them offhand, but I know Fish Creek, uh, Bailey's Harbor, uh, you're co-located on our tower and there will be this project builds fiber right, right to the doorstep of those, uh, of those uh, uh, towers. Uh, time frames on this, we had targeted early on to complete this in 2013, but based on some budgetary constraints and, and the need to put some money elsewhere within our network, we uh, diverted some of our capital for those years. Uh, and we're coming back to that now. So I can't give you an, a precise time frame over for completion right now, but uh, as I mentioned, we've worked with the county on a number of projects. We're very interested in working with the county on, on this project. We think it's a win-win. Our, our company values that public-private partnership that we think is uh, not only good for our organization uh, to further our business, obviously, but uh, we think it's good for public safety and public interest as well. And uh, we've had a, a long-standing uh, productive relationship with the county in, in that uh, regard. I should mention probably the, uh, the only two disclaimers that I would leave you with you this morning is that uh, in this type of partnership, one of the, the restrictions is that I still have to go back to the Ensite Board of Directors for final approval on a project. Um, uh, as with any capital project, uh, you know, that's a standard procedure. And also the competitive nature of it. We're in a very competitive business. And when we do this uh, type of arrangement, we would want to have restrictions so that uh, the, the, the fiber that we would provide to the county would be used for county and public safety use uh, and not for um, commercial enterprise use. Uh, and that's some pretty standard within our industry and we've had those kind of discussions before. So, um, If I can answer any questions for you, I'll take a shot at it. I apologize for going through that fast, but I wanted to be respectful of your time as well. Anybody yes, ma'am. I'll ask the proverbial stupid question, <laughs> I don't know. which I'm very good at. <laughs> um, and I, you might have touched on it when you said it couldn't be used for commercial. Mm -hmm. So to a constituent who lives in the country and has terrible service, when this is all done, assuming it is, does that, how does that affect the average person who's not in the city and thus doesn't have the... <laughs> They're going to get better wireless service, number one, on, on our CellCom network because there's going to be greater capacity and improved performance of that network. That will be one of the results of it. So it'll be an, it will be a significant enhancement to our wireless network in the county. And a big enhancement to public safety. The driving force was to Anybody else got any questions? Wow. You it couldn't have, have been that good. I'm really confused or we're very smart. It couldn't have been that good, but thank, <laughs> you, for, thank you for your time. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, okay, we were going to have the, the bad thing at 10 o'clock, so I don't want to start it. Before. There might be some people coming that want to hear it. So we'll start going through the agenda fully here, or fastly. Um, next item is the uh, administrator's monthly report. Yes, thank you. Um, in your packet is the written monthly report. <clears throat> Excuse me, there are primarily three items this month. Uh, in particular, the mission team uh, has, uh, as you all know, they're working closely with Rob Burke with our UW Extension Office, and their charge was to come up with non-monetary ways given all of the changes that we've been through with the implementation of Act 10 non-monetary ways to make sure that our employees are, are satisfied and happy with uh, working for us. Uh, their charges to morale really is, is the essence of it. So they got together with Rob Burke and created a workplace climate survey of our employees. Uh, that survey is now done. The results are being calculated by Rob Burke and he anticipates having this out to everyone via an email so this is kind of the forewarned is forearmed. So on July 1st, he 
he'll be sending an email to all of us this would include the county board the department heads all of the employees will get the survey results at exactly the same time i anticipate in a discussion with rob he is our survey expert within this building uh, he tells me and i think we've all read articles institutions don't fare well right now when uh, it comes to how how uh, people and how citizens uh, look at them. Congress has all-time low ratings. I think they might even be in the single digits. The last survey I think I saw was about 12 percent. Media in also is in low. They're at about, I think, 20 percent in talking to Rob. I anticipate that bosses, which is what the 21 of you are, which is what I am and department heads are, don't generally rate well when it comes to workplace climate issues. So my advice when you see this survey, I think if we prepare for the worst and we kind of hope for the best, I think we're going to be uh, in a good place. So I, I don't think the ratings on all of us are going to be that high, but hopefully I'm wrong. Um, and the ratings for all of us will, will be good, but anticipate something um, that doesn't surprise you when it comes on July 1st. And remember, this is the work of the mission team is only half done. They wanted to gauge where our employees are because they were hearing that some of our employees are very happy to work here, very happy about their wages and benefits, and others were dissatisfied, mainly because of Act 10 and some of the whip flea pay studies and some of the changes that we've made to health insurance. So really that's why they embarked on this, creating this workplace climate, so that they could gauge what are the real true feelings. The, uh, the, the survey itself, I'm told from Rob, about 220 employees completed it. And if we go with our average number of 350, I think we're going to get some pretty decent results. That's a pretty good. I think on average, Rob told me somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% is what you can expect. So we're well over those numbers, probably double that. Um, and he will, he will come before you. Um, maybe in your Ju July meeting, we'll see how things go, Mr. Chairman, um, but he will certainly report with the co-chairs of the mission team, Jake Erickson, Dwayne Kuntz, at the July Administrative uh, Committee with the results. Um, in addition, uh, department head meeting and employee briefings are planned for July as well. So, which leads us into, I, th I think the way to look at the survey is prepare for the worst and just hope for the best and we'll see where it ends up. Um, Citizens Academy, on a more positive note, and perhaps depending upon what the results are on that employee survey, we might want to create an employee academy as well. Um, but the Citizens Academy came out of uh, an idea, I think uh, several of us went to the February WCA conference. Many of our citizens can't name who their county board member is. Uh, some don't have a sense of all of the services that we provide. Remember, we can um, uh, put in that A to Z from the airport to zoning on the services that we provide to our citizens. So Supervisors Kohout and Miller and myself met uh, to begin the process to create a C Citizens Academy and uh, I think it was Supervisor Miller that had the very good idea of rather than us coming up with uh, ways to educate our citizens, let's tap into two that we know that are active. Helen Bacon and Seth I'm hoping I do your name Weeder justice. Weeder Anders. Thank you, Weeder Anders. Uh, we got together with the two of them and kind of picked their brains to see what they'd like to see. So I think we're well on our way. They already had one good idea in uh, if we're looking for potential attendees for a Citizens Academy, we, we might want to tap into those folks that already serve on the many boards and commissions that we have here in Door County. So we anticipate another meeting in July and as I said, we might even want to do an employee academy when we're talking to our own uh, employees about all the services that we provide and what their, what their colleagues do in other departments. And then finally attached to your monthly is the uh, monthly column that was just published in the Peninsula Pulse and Door County Daily News is about to feature it on their website. It talks about um, where our tax rate is. It's a good indication of our financial health. Uh, Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance rates our tax rate at uh, eighth lowest out of 72 counties, which is a pretty good place to be, and kudos to all of you, and in particular our finance department. 
that really is the, the group that's most responsible. All of us are, but our finance department really has done a great job of main helping us maintain that low tax rate. That's what I have to report. Thank you. Any questions? If not, uh, we'll go to the minutes and a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Kathy, second the <coughs> David Leno. Are there any corrections or additions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. That is passed. Um, go to the resolutions now. Uh, Biz, you want to read uh, the resolution in memory of Ralph and then make a motion to approve it? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Resolution 2014-51 is in memory of Ralph M. Smith to the Door County Board of Supervisors, whereas Ralph M. Smith passed away on May 25th, 2014, and whereas Supervisor Smith was duly elected to the Door County Board of Supervisors in April 1966 and was re-elected in April 1968, serving for a total of four years. And whereas Supervisor Smith represented Supervisory District at that time, uh, number five, Town of Sevastopol. Whereas Supervisor Smith served on several committees including Health and Welfare, Civil Defense, Chamber of Commerce, and Highway Committee, and now, therefore, be re resolved that the Board of Supervisors assembled in regular session this 24th day of June 2014 extend our sincere sympathy to the Ralph Smith's family with acknowledgement of his dedication to the citizens of Door County. And I'd make a motion that we adopt resolution uh, in memory of Ralph Smith. I'll no, second that motion. Okay, seconded by <coughs> Theo. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> that is passed. Biz, do you want to make a... Yeah, I'd like to <coughs> just make a couple comments about this. Um, Ralph uh, was uh, uh, a constituent of mine and uh, lived in uh, District 15, the eastern portion of Sevastopol. And Ralph... Uh, was, was uh, a historian and fortunately there was a recording made before his passing about some of the history of Door County, uh, namely how important uh, the Lily Bay area was and the sawmill uh, located at Lily Bay because back in the days when, when before the ship canal was dug, uh, many of the supplies for the city of Sturgeon Bay landed at, at a dock at Lily Bay. And that was a very important because that was a straight shot from, from Lake Michigan to go uh, straight into Sturgeon Bay with goods. And of course that changed after the ship canal was built and ships didn't have to go up around Northport to, to get into Sturgeon Bay. But at any rate, what I uh, would like to uh, advise the board and also the public is that uh, you can go to YouTube dot com and type in Ralph Smith Sawmill and you'll be able to see a very very interesting video about this history that I that I just stated. He was a very very knowledgeable person and and uh, there is a video out there. If you have any trouble uh, finding it you can also go to TV at doorbell dot net and uh, and you can get help there too. But again, uh, go to uh, youtube.com, type in Ralph Smith Sawmill, and you're going to see a very interesting uh, video. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Leo? I would only add that he made some of the finest sawmill wine. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think a number of us have participated in that. <laughs> the next item is the um, resolution. 2014-52 in support of state funding and emergency dispatch. Susan, I'd like to call on you to uh, make the motion and explain it. Okay. Well, start explaining. Tim is going to do most of it. Um, is it okay if I read this whole resolution? 
I guess you know. so, sure. <laughs> well, there's Go a ahead. lot There's a lot in it. That okay, why don't you make a motion and we'll second okay. it so we can... I move that we adopt resolution 2014-52 in support of state funding for county emergency dispatch 911 services, one designated public safety answering point per county. Okay, is there a second? Second by Kathy. Go ahead, no. Um, whereas the countywide emergency 911 dispatch services are among the most vital services that counties provide. Wisconsin residents and visitors alike expect the same level of excellent service throughout the state regardless of where their emergency occurs. And whereas in 2003, the state of Wisconsin established a fee on all wireless phones to fund grants to counties to pay for enhanced 911 services, such as wireless call locating software and equipment. And whereas in 2009, the enhanced 911 grant program expired, and in its place, the Wisconsin Counties Association and the state's telecommunications providers advocated establishing a permanent grant program to fund equipment purchases and training for employees of county designated public safety answering points, each county to designate one PSAP per county by resolution to be funded with a monthly fee of up to 75 cents on all devices capable of dialing 911. And whereas instead of funding grants to county public service answering points, in 2009 the Wisconsin legislature and the <coughs> governor redesignated the funding as a 75 cent monthly police and fire protection fee for all such devices and directed the revenue from the fee to fund the county and municipal aid shared revenue account to meet other state financial obligations. And whereas without the fun intended state funding, counties must rely almost entirely on property taxes to pay for equipment, training, and consolidation of municipal and county 911 services, with many counties unable to upgrade needed equipment to receive texts, video, and still photographs to provide needed training to 911 system operators and to foster further consolidation of services. And whereas eliminating the police and fire protection fee and restoring the funding for 911 without replacing the lost revenue would result in a roughly $50 million annual reduction in shared revenue payments to municipalities and counties. And whereas under current law, each county must individually contract with a telecommunications provider for telephone lines running into each county 911 center, and counties must depend on a maximum 40 cent monthly fee on only landline telephones to pay telecommunications <clears throat> providers for the cost of this service. And whereas revenues from the 40 cent landline fee are declining due to the increased use of cellular telephones, and the fee is often insufficient to cover the cost of these services, thereby requiring any difference to be paid for with property taxes. Now therefore be it resolved that the Door County Board of Supervisors hereby urges the Wisconsin Legislature and Governor to support legislation and state budget action that accomplishes all of the following goals. First, fully funds the county and municipal aid program, shared revenue, with state general purpose revenue rather than the police and fire protection fee. Two, establishes a technology neutral fee on all cell phones, in landline phones, and other devices capable of dialing 911. Three, uses the revenue from this fee to fund a grant program to pay for equipment purchases and training for one public safety answering point, 911 center, per county, as designated by the county board of each county, and to develop financial incentives to encourage consolidation of 911 services and fourth, provides a sustainable source of funding for costs associated with providing all telephone lines, landline, and cellular into county public safety answering points. Um, and the rest is to just to send a copy. Um, you might remember that in February, you passed a resolution urging support of a bill to deal with some of these issues. It wasn't exactly the same. The bill died. Not, it did not go where we had hoped it would go. Um, and there is <coughs> lobbying going on now in the hope that when the next legislature comes in and the budget is created, these issues will be dealt with. Tim, I hope you're here. You're way back there. Yes. To answer 
answer questions. Or Does anybody got any questions? Most intelligent group I've ever seen. <laughs> okay, any, no questions? All in favor of the resolution say aye. 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 Opposed? That is passed unanimously. Um, next item is the carry forward for general fund. David, you know, you want to explain it and make a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll make a motion that we approve resolution 2014 53, which is carry forward to the general fund account. Is there a second? Second Seconded by David Hanigal. Go ahead. What this pertains to is annually the Finance Committee works with the Finance Department um, in accordance with our rules. We have carry forwards from last year projects or grants that cover multiple years. So they may have been approved in 2013, but they're going to be completed in 2014 or even 2015, and they were funded. So we need to move those funds into the respective non lapsing accounts into this year's budget so that that can continue. There is a copy attached, and if we need more explanation, I'm certain Shirley is available. Okay, anybody got any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is passed. Uh, next item is the uh, committee appointments. Uh, there's only one, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, somebody would like to make a motion to uh, approve the appointment of... Uh, Vicki Stangel. And you can explain. Someone make a motion to approve her? So moved. Seconded by Susan. You want to explain... Uh, appointments uh, this is the revolving loan committee uh, and Vicki is is in your packet you have a brief summary since she's a new appointment uh, she's a CPA and this would be to the loan review committee anybody have any questions all in favor say aye, aye. aye. opposed <coughs> that is carried mm -hmm. um, We'll take the last one before we get into the cave. Uh, the transfer of non-budgeted funds for the ambulance cots. Um, Joel, I guess you're the... Well, it's coming from finance, but... Make a, a motion to... A yeah, I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2014-55. Is there a second? Second by Chuck Brand. This is really coming from the finance committee, but it has more to do with the EMS department. You want to explain? Yeah, I mean, is, is Dan here? Dan's yes, here. Danny is here. You want Dan to come forward? Sure. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but he can clarify. <clears throat> Dan, you want to summarize what it is? And sure. The motion has been made. Our, Go ahead. In review of our equipment that we currently have in the department, <clears throat> we came to like that uh, the ambulance costs that we're currently using um, have not uh, maintained a regular maintenance-type maintenance type schedule. Um, we also found out that the cuts that we have have already exceeded the lifetime of their, um, by the manufacturer, of their expected lifetime. Um, so we had to um, look into if we could get them serviced, and the company also uh, refused to service them because it had exceeded the lifetime. So we were requesting um, the immediate purchase of uh, four uh, cots, and then the, uh, in the next year, in this budget, current budget cycle, to uh, get the other six cots during that process. Uh, so a total of 10, which is what we have in our fleet. Does anybody have any questions? I don't know what was mentioned, but I think we should uh, inform everybody that they are $15,000 a piece. Yes, they are. They're very expensive. So has anybody got any questions? David. I would just mention that this is not coming out of the unassigned fund balance. It's coming out of the contingency fund. Okay. Anybody? Does that need a roll call vote, Grant? You need two thirds, you need 14. And so, you don't have a unanimous vote. Okay. Voice All vote. in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> that takes care of the two thirds. That was it. Okay, we'll go back to public comment on um, the talk on the cave. Uh, just to remind everybody, we there's a whole page of rules and regulations. Basically, what it says that you can talk to three minutes apiece. And uh, the um, public comment period is only supposed to last 30 minutes. You're not supposed to be repetitious, and you're supposed to be polite. So does anybody want to step forward and talk up on the <coughs> I know there. And state your name also. Go ahead, Gary. Welcome to the Door County Board of Supervisors. My name is Gary Soule, and I am from Sturgeon Bay here. 
Uh, I am on the board of directors, and I'm also the grotto historian for the statewide Wisconsin Speleological Society. And I've been thinking for years that the public could walk in upright comfort if just the first 370 feet of the 3,103 foot long cave had its glacial sediment removed. I first approached George Pinney, the Door County Parks Director, back on February 5th, 2008, with my dream for the many tourists, residents, and students alike to see the cave without having to crawl in mud and water. Otherwise, who'd want to get back into their clean cars? It would be a terrific educational guided tour. George Penny embraced my show cave multi-use concept as did the Wisconsin Spinological Society. Things were all falling nicely into place until the unexpected death of George Penny from cancer. As for the present management plan, three things, three things need to happen after the total cave excess is achieved by the county. First is to create a wide path at a gentle, wheelchair accessible grade going up to the bedrock passage floor outside the cave gate. Four old trees and some brush would need to be removed to open up the former passageway trench outside the cave. This would increase public awareness through visibility of the cave from County Highway G. Second, the current plan for various volunteers to run back and forth for as little as four visitors each is really impractical. For example, just requiring advanced reservations eliminates the many tourists who just want to walk over from the nearby Murphy County Park and get an educational tour on a hot summer weekend day. Just station a couple of hired college park workers at the cave, say from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekends in the summer. Walk up tourists, and others could be charged $5 a head to rent county supplied lights. This would cover not only the cost of lights, but the guides as well. The cave tours themselves could be free, and that's also in connection with liability reasons. Groups would be limited to the county desired minimum of 12, and only one group of people would be in the cave at a time. Third, this is going to work. What needs to be done is the ideal way is to provide directional signs to the cave. Uh, and the problem with that is I am feeling they need to take and incorporate the newly created 14 acres of parkland and cave and have that new part be named Horseshoe Bay Cave County Park. The existing Frank E. Murphy County Park across the road would fully retain its original name and all its acreage. This way, people traveling on State Highway 42 would see a simple, keyword, standard county park sign for Horseshoe Bay Cave County Park, just like they do for Frank Murphy County Park. This is a vital component of the ultimate success of letting people know about this unique underground opportunity. And at this time, uh, I would like to address that we are fortunate to have our statewide chairman, uh, Casey Fisk from Prairie du Sac, who is going to speak to you folks. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, the county board, for letting me speak today. Um, I just want to go over a couple of aspects of why we want to lower the floor of the entrance of the cave. It's very important. Uh, we currently have three dig operations in the state of Wisconsin where actually we are improving caves um, for better public access. Um, and the reason we do that is first just consider when I first became a member of the Wisconsin's Biological Society, we used to be, it was always at was footage in inches, we used to call, and people would be actually mining themselves into these caves, crawling right along the ceiling, actually technically destroying the formations, which was a big no-no, um, and also it, it harming the bats and other fauna that may be up near the ceiling of the caves. Uh, 2006, we went back to revisit a lot of those caves and got away from that, so we went back and actually started excavating out the caves. The reason being is we want to get away from the ceiling. We want to protect the formations, we want to protect the fauna, we want to protect the bats that are at the ceiling. 
So the reason for lowering the floor is for the protection, protection of the king. Um, if you look at uh, the projects that we've had in the state, um, we've, we have now have free public tours that we do give at Maribel, Cherney, Kings County Park. Um, we have anywhere from 300 to 500 people that come out to see those caves. Uh, we do f give free public tours on the third Sunday every month, and I encourage any of the board members to come down and see what we've actually done there in the caves. Now, not only just lowering the floor to protect the ceiling and protect the walls is the major impact of that, but if you understand the, the water uh, hydrographics in the cave, you're going to see that there's a place in the cave called the duck under. And you may even hear referring to that. And there's actually is water that comes out of the cave, but you don't really see it coming out of the entrance of the cave because it goes, all goes underground and actually goes into the bay and disappears. Now, if you were to lower the floor, um, like we proposed, and then if you could redirect, and I'm not saying that you're going to increase the flow of the water of the cave, you're just going to redirect <coughs> part of that water that comes out of the cave and actually re redirect it through where the entrance is, that's going to have improvements aesthetically, that people will be able to see that stream, um, and also is going to increase the humidity in the cave, which is important for the climate in the cave, um, not only for the formations, so they can, technically the for entrance of that cave is a dead, because all the formations aren't growing anymore, but if you increase water flow through that cave, <coughs> just have just a little stream going through, you increase the humidity, it controls the climate in the cave, so the through the bats and the fauna that are in the cave, there's not these huge fluctuations in temperature, and the bats that do hibernate in there don't have to reposition themselves constantly because it keeps getting colder in the cave. And we've actually, the cave at Maribel, um, when we first started excavating in that cave, it was a dry cave. You'd actually go in there and it would be dusty. And after you'd come out, you'd blow your nose and you'd have a Kleenex full of, you know, dust. But now that we've restored the cave, all the formations, the humidity levels all come up, the, the temperature in the cave is stabilized, um, all the formations are re-dripping again, the cave is actually alive again, where, where before it was, was actually technically a dead cave. So we've actually restored that. And the climate, not having all the fluctuations in the temper and stuff like that, is better for the animals that do live in the cave. Secondly, if you are to remove the sediment, Keep in mind, this cave does flood every year, okay? Probably a couple times a year when you have large amounts of water. That water backs up into the cave and it actually floods the back parts of the cave. Now, years back, I've been told about cavers that have actually gone in underneath. They, there's a sump area where the water goes to the ceiling. They've been able to get through there and they go into these back passages where all the bats are and there's anywhere from tens to hundreds of bats floating dead on the water because they actually drown in the cave. Now, if you had lowered the floor to the point that the water can escape, then that almost acts like a flood gauge for, for actually when you have flooding in the cave, and it's so that the water does not, isn't able to flood the cave and kill all the bats that are in the back of the cave. So I think it's very important that we lower the floor for, the, for not only just to protect the formations on the ceiling, protect the fawn in the cave, the bats, and also um, to prevent the flooding that does take place in the cave. Now, I see a lot of people in here, and I'm sure that wouldn't, would like to see the cave, but I'm sure you do not want to crawl into the cave. So the obvious thing about lowering the floor, it's going to give more public access, and that's what we're all about here, talking about access to the cave. Um, much easier to walk through the cave, um, and it eliminates the people from actually being able to touch the cave. Touch the ceiling, damage the walls, damage the formations. So it's always a good idea that we want to lower the floor so people can walk in. Especially when you have tour guides in there. If you have people that are crawling in a long train of people, you can't see what's going on behind you because you, you're just going in a tight crawling space. But if it's open cave, you can take this 12 group of people that come in here. There's better control for the trustees that are going to be taking people through the cave. <coughs> so that's very important to do that. And the other second thing as far as opening up the cave like it is, you actually are increasing the surface area of the cave. You're increasing the habitat for the bats that are in the cave. Um, all these excavation projects that we've had, our bat numbers have actually increased, not decreased because of our work in the caves. Um, I just want to stress that point. Uh, that our populations are increasing in the cave of work. As a matter of fact, Maribel New Hope Cave, 
we had voluntarily, I think it was six years even before White Nose was known to be in the state, we voluntarily just stopped working in the caves in the wintertime because our populations were getting so big, and big in the cave. Um, I will be available for, for questions after the meeting if anybody wants to come, come forward. And also there is a display here, I hope everybody takes a look at that, um, showing the Maribel Cave that I was talking about, comparison to what a Horseshoe Bay looks like now and what it could look like if you were to actually lower the front of the cave. Thank you for your time. Um, and I hope to maybe speak to you some, some after the meeting. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Go ahead. Come on. State your name. Uh, my name is Brian Kleist. Uh, I'm the current vice chair with the Wisconsin Speleological Society. Um, I would just like to say that um, being that this is a, a public uh, county park, that really we should be looking at the, uh, allowing the majority of the public in to see their park. Um, I know you all have families, and when you have time off on vacation, a lot of you go to a national park or out of state to see the beautiful wonders of our American country. And I, I want to stress the point that it's, it's important that our youth to our very old get to share in this, to, to, know, to learn about our country's be beautiful scenery and park system. Now when I was 11, I had the privilege of being able to go to the Redwoods, Carl's Bad Caverns, the Grand Canyon, and so on. What would turn it from, from a, went from a week, went to two weeks. My brother, two years younger, he was nine, the parents and the grandparents. We were all together. It's, it's a memory that will always stick in my head, and it's why I'm here. Not so much because of this organization, it wouldn't matter. I firmly believe Americans have the right to experience their parks. Be, due to the economic crisis, a lot of people can't go to the national parks, but they can see our state, county, and city parks. <coughs> I know how important the park system is. I've seen it firsthand working out there as a volunteer in Calumet as well as Manitowoc County Caves. <clears throat> My wife and I, we come up this past weekend, went out to get some petition uh, signatures. Nine out of ten people signed the petition. I mean, they, they, they would really like to experience this cave and they'd like to do it in a safe manner. Our efforts have shown this is the safest way to do it. I mean, common sense tells us a walking passage is much safer than a small, narrow, crawling passage. It's also common sense that this is protecting our fragile formations or allowing them to regrow by keeping them out of harm's way, up out of the way in the ceiling. Also, the bat numbers, not only just the bats, but the rest of the cave inhabitants increase. A dead cave is becoming alive again. The cave that was once there, pre-glacial times, is returning. We're restoring it. Now, at the last meeting, it was said that 1,800 visitors will be able to see, I think, I believe, don't quote me exactly, but I believe it was right around 1,800 visitors will be able to see the cave as it is. Well, that seems very low. Ledgeview Nature Center, 33,000 a year. Three, four, five hundred sometimes in one day at Cherney Maribel. That's a lot of people. 1,800, that just seems very, very low. If we want to get the people in there to see the cave, it can only be done by restoring it. Now, our organization, we are willing to donate up to $2,000 just if you could dig down another three feet and extend that gate with the stipulation that prior and before the gate was down to bedrock as well as behind the gate 75 feet. The county owns that. Let's, let's give the, the citizens that much. Let's start there. Um, so I guess that's all I have for you and thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? <coughs> Good morning, my name is Mike Tonys. I'm a resident of Nassawapi, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the bats at Horseshoe Bay Cave. 
I am a member of the stakeholders advisory group that has met repeatedly as this plan was developed. <clears throat> You're going to be asked to vote on the plan today. I ask that you vote on it as it is written. Um, a couple of the gentlemen behind me that have spoken are also members of the advisory group. We are all interested in people being able to visit and appreciate Horseshoe Bay Cave. I would ask that you go slow on any development of the cave, any human changes in the cave. We don't always do things better than Mother Nature. Uh, there's always chances for new information to come forward to make it um, perhaps safer and less risky for the bats to do some development. Um, it's a living document. The plan is a living document. Mr. Schuster has said that on several occasions during the plan development. And as more information comes forward, then perhaps we can more safely develop the cave for more and more people to be able to visit and appreciate it. But please, at this point, I ask that you vote for it as it is written. It's a conservative plan. It is meant both for bats and people. But nobody um, yet today has spoken for the bats. I'm here to speak for the bats. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? If not, that closes public participation. Uh, Grant or Bill Schuster, how long is the, uh, going to take the, I'm thinking of a break now instead of after. I think a break now would be fine. Okay, we'll take a five to ten minute break. <clears throat>
the county ownership goes roughly up to the cloakroom, maybe a little bit past that. Um, as you can see, it's a very long, narrow cave. Um, there's certainly different rooms throughout the cave as you um, venture back further. I got my first opportunity this winter to go in and help uh, the DNR do a little bit of <coughs> surveillance uh, for the white nose bat syndrome. Um, this is showing the entrance of the cave right off of the pasture area, uh, part way up the slope there. Um, this diagram shows very good um, kind of visual of how a lot of these caves are formed with a lot of the sinkholes and seepages off of the surface coming down through the karst rock that we have throughout Door County here um, in the Niagara Dolomite. Um, there's a lot of caves and fractures that are formed and eventually um, lead to um, entrances along the Niagara Escarpment, different openings. Um, we like a couple of these pictures. The one on the left with the white shirt and tie, um, probably one of the earlier known pictures that we have of visitors going in back in the 1930s. Um, 1970s, a group of Sturgeon Bay teachers were up in the cave there. And actually, this uh, was just from February this winter. He was truly here with the wetsuit on. And you'll see some pictures of Bill and Grant later on as we've gotten to go on a couple times during this whole management plan development process. Um, one of the first steps is the county did uh, obtain the ownership to the entrance of the cave back in two or three years ago was in 2012 replacing the gate um, going into the cave basically to help facilitate a safer passage, easier passage for the bats in and out and the airflow and um, kind of bring it up to the new standards. And uh, um, Next slide shows a little bit of uh, whatever it looks like before and after, of course. It's a very narrow, muddy passage through the majority of the cave, and uh, wetsuits are required uh, definitely further past the, the first part of the county ownership of the cave. Um, with that, I, I'll turn things over to Jennifer for the next part of the presentation to give you a little bit of a virtual tour. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm happy to uh, explain a little bit about this uh, highly unique cave. Every cave is unique, and it's exciting to be able to uh, to share a cave with folks and to share a little bit about bats. Um, so the cave is actually divided into different zones. There's four of them, and these zones were selected based on uh, a number of factors, including uh, cave ecology, the skill and uh, ability required to access these areas, uh, issues of safety, and also issues of sensitivity. And what you'll see is that um, as we go through the cave today, I've divided our tour up into zones. So we'll progress from zone one to zone two, and, and so on and so forth. Um, one other thing that I'll point out on this map, uh, you'll notice that there's three areas with bat symbols. There's three uh, large concentrations of bats uh, in the cave during the winter months, and by winter I mean October 1st through May 15th each year. That's our bat hibernation season in Wisconsin. And um, if you look at the bottom of this map, there's a profile view. Uh, it's an exa exaggerated profile, uh, but what it shows is that the cave is a series of crawlways uh, punctuated by elongated chambers or rooms where the ceiling goes from perhaps uh, three or four feet uh, in height up to heights of 30 feet uh, or greater. And the bats have selected some of those higher ceilings uh, to hibernate away from predation uh, risk. So as we travel through zone one, zone one extends from the cave entrance to the cloakroom. It's under county ownership. And the ceiling is low. It's an area of the cave that's highly variable. It's affected by outdoor weather conditions and temperatures. Uh, we see a great deal of fluctuation in temperature, humidity, and airflow in this area. And it's also the most highly diverse part of the cave. And if Bill clicks once more, uh, it's an area that occasionally acts as a, a spring or a resurgence point where water uh, coming down into the cave system from above, as Eric illustrated, um, can flow out of the cave. As I mentioned, it's a highly diverse area. We have a lot of invertebrate diversity in this space, and a lot of these uh, animals are using the cave as day shelter, but then seeking their sustenance perhaps at night when they leave the cave to feed. 
We have incidental uh, larger mammals that use this area, bringing nutrient material into the cave. And it's also the first place in the cave where we encounter bats during the hibernation season. Um, in this case, big brown bats can withstand highly variable temperatures and humidities, and so we find them there. About a third of the bats that hibernate in Horseshoe Bay Cave hibernate in the cloakroom. It's the first area where you can stand up inside the cave, and again, it's under county ownership, but it's only about 75 feet of the entrance. The floor of the cloakroom and the floor of Zone 1 is filled with sandy clay and sediment, and it's not just sand, clay, and gravel, but if we take a closer look at uh, the sediment, we've got flowstone or, or calcite forming over the flowstone in some places, uh, creating a sealed uh, record of sediment deposition. And then if we look up close at the walls, we've got um, things like clay vermiculations that may serve as nutrient material for some of the critters that live in the cave. Uh, and also some fossil or bone remains may be present in sediment. As we move on into zone two, things begin to stabilize and we encounter the first area of total darkness in Horseshoe Bay Cave. And uh, this is a zone that again has low ceilings punctuated by high domed uh, elongated chambers where a person can stand. I'll we'll flip to the next slide. We still have uh, incidental animals wandering into this area, using this area, uh, particularly invertebrates. Here's a wasp. And we do see bats throughout this space as well. The more common bat in this area is the eastern pipistrelle. The Rocky Mountain Room is one of the places where we encounter uh, a lot of nice speleothems or cave formations. So you might be familiar with stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, some of those are forming on the walls and ceilings. And the Rocky Mountain Room has a floor that has large pieces of, of rock uh, or breakdown on the ground. And on top of this rock, there are small isolated pools. Um, and this is the first uh, spot where our invertebrate specialist uh, encountered a potentially a uh, unique species for Horseshoe Bay Cave. It's a species of mite that lives on the surface of one of these pools. Moving beyond the Rocky Mountain Room, things begin to get very wet and uh, things become very characteristic uh, of Horseshoe Bay Cave, which is that it's a wet, muddy crawl. And in some places you can avoid the water, but wetsuits are necessary. Um, anytime you're getting wet in a cave uh, and you're gonna stay wet because the cave is 50 degrees, so is the rock, so is the soil, so is the water. So um, people can get cold very quickly without the benefit of the wetsuit. At the end of zone two, uh, we encounter a room called the wall room, and here's where things begin to change a little bit for this cave system. Um, a person entering the cave needs to negotiate a 10-foot climb in order to access uh, the areas beyond the wall room. And once we move beyond the wall room into zone three, um, we begin to see a bedrock floor and the isopod that popped up there is another potentially uh, cave endemic species. Mm -hmm. So we have very few photos from zone three and there's a good reason for that. It's just really hard to get a camera out uh, in that space. It's impossible uh, to keep clean and um, slogging through, through mud and water is uh, what takes place through all of zone three very few places where a person can stand and we still continue to see occasional speleothems, occasional incidental uh, invertebrate species and bats. And moving on into zone four, again, the nature of the cave changes a little bit. Uh, we drop down uh, from the bedrock uh, floored passageway of zone three into a lower level of the cave uh, that leads to an area called the big room. And the way to negotiate that drop is to walk or climb between the walls uh, down for about 15 or 20 feet through a crevice. And it's uh, a maneuver that does require some skill on the part of the, the caver. At the bottom of that crevice, there's a, a muddy tube um, filled typically with water and at some times of the year we see that this water has dried up into different puddles. And it's a place where we've encountered a groundwater amphipod. Again, um, it may be unique uh, to Horseshoe Bay Cave and cave adapted. But upon entering, or excuse me, exiting that watery tube, uh, we pop out into the largest space in the cave called the Big Room. It's one of the largest underground spaces in Wisconsin. And the ceiling's about 40 feet high and to get from Simply to get into the room uh, requires, again, some climbing and, and climbing down over a ledge. 
And this is the room where the majority of the bats in Horseshoe Bay Cave uh, have selected to hibernate. So um, we have about 1,250 individual bats that use the cave every year. These are the same individuals that come back to the cave year after year. During the spring and summer months, they spread out as far as 280 miles away from Horseshoe Bay Cave, but the same bats return uh, each year to hibernate here. And they may live as long as 25 or 35 years. So primarily we have little brown bats in this cave. Uh, we do know that there have been um, mass mortality events or likely mass mortality events in the cave. You heard um, some of the caving community members mention uh, occasional flooding. What we don't know is when that's occurring or why. Um, we do know that we've got a lot of bat bones on the floor in some parts of the cave. There's uh, a great deal of water, moisture, humidity in the big room and that's why you're seeing some of the photos look a little bit grainy. The uh, flash is bouncing off humidity in the air. So here we've got two little brown bats mating, clustering together on the wall. And when we leave the big room, we again have to negotiate uh, that watery tube, climb back up the crevice. And at this point, most folks um, who've visited the cave in the past leave the cave by crawling out uh, another muddy passageway back towards the entrance. Um, however, the cave does continue and go further um, under the escarpment at this point as well. It's an area that most people don't access um, and at many times of the year that area is flooded. Uh, there's very few photos uh, from that part of the cave. But this is a little bit of what that area looks like. This is called an ear dipper. <laughs> so there's very low airspace. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. What I want to talk a little bit about is how we started the project and, and, and the process. And back in 2013, early 2013, uh, Grant and I stepped into this project because of George Penny's passing and, and the need to proceed with some grant money and some program opportunities that were available. And one of the one of the things that we when we started with the process is is that. If you're going to be doing an inventory and a management plan, you, you need to talk about and look at various options that, that you have for a cave. And, you know, on this end, you got the far end, which is you close the cave for whatever reason, ownership, safety, whatever it might be. And then they're kind of working your way through their science and exploration. And, and then really, when you get in the middle, you start talking about management of a cave in, in different areas that reflect the, the skill set and the safety of different individuals. And uh, there are many caves in, in the world where people stand outside of them, watch bats go in and out. And also, there are sections in caves, particularly the front 300 feet of this cave, that, that the general public can, can go in fairly easy and you, you crawl with fairly high ceilings. But then there's the far other spectrum, and some of you certainly have been to some of those caves, which are very commercial caves with light shows and, and walkways and even little trolleys and such. As you can see what Jennifer just showed you, Horseshoe, Horseshoe Bay Cave does not lend itself to that end of the spectrum, no matter what you do. And as a number of people pointed out, after 370 feet, when you climb that 10-foot wall, the rest of it is bedrock bottom. You know, so it's, it's that front section where uh, potentially some alteration could be done and, and then it's just about three feet of sediment. The cave, when we had to work our way around to what, where are we going and what do we need to be concerned with. And the cave isn't about, the management plan isn't about one of these things. It's, it's all of them, trying to understand what the resource is, how can we protect it, make it available for research, take the opportunity to educate the public about hydrology and bats and habitat and, and getting, getting out of their comfort zone to a certain amount. Also work out access, uh, an opportunity for access under, under proper conditions. And administration, you know, this is a part of the parks and, and Eric wasn't uh, here yet, but we were talking at that point as how the next parks director, we needed to be setting up a, a framework for the new parks director to administer that. And then also the publicity. The cave has been fairly well known in circles and local people, but it's not, not known outside of those circles to, at all. And then certainly this one is very important. 
is is safety and, and rescue. You know, the front front section of the cave, maybe someone will bang their head on on the ceiling if they aren't wearing a, a helmet, but there's not a heck of a lot of their safety concerns. But when you get past the uh, the the wall room, then there's opportunities for for something to happen, and, and we need to be talking about that whole safety and, and, and the future. And, and the future of the cave is, and someone else said it, and, <coughs> and we keep saying that, that this is a living document, and it is, it is designed to change as we all know more. All right, so the process is we had two advisory groups. And first, the, the first, one of the advisory groups was the science group. And these were the people who are are experts in various fields, and I don't have to read them all off, but it is, it is, the cave is not just geology, or not just bats, or not just, but we wanted to search, search out a lot of experts in different fields for them to give us their advice as how this cave should be managed going into the, into the future. We also had the stakeholder group, and we, we made a point of trying to get a real cross-section of the community. And we, you know, we have the, the managers and the owners of the cave, which certainly people who are, are involved in managing other property in Door County, educators, because we're, we're committed to this being an education opportunity. We had uh, two or three members of the, of the Cavers Association of the state that were either on the, on the advisory committee or participating. We had two people representing economic development and tourism, and certainly the town of Egg Harbor, who we've made a point of trying to stay in touch with and keep them informed because you know they, they are the host town. The process, and we don't have to spend a heck of a lot of time about this, but it really was gathering information, bringing information back to the advisory groups, trying to understand how this can be managed within county administration and budgets and responsibilities, the Parks Committee, the Director, uh, Science and Legal from Grant, and then the core group working our way through the Parks Committee and then ultimately, ultimately to you. Uh, at this point, what I want to do is, is one of the initial driving forces of DNR's interest is the white nose syndrome that's uh, having a heck of an impact on the bat community in, in the nation. We want to give you a little bit of a, uh, a white nose syndrome update. So, Jennifer? All right, uh, we're at a critical time in bat conservation. Um, most importantly, and specifically this year, we found white nose syndrome here in the state of Wisconsin, which we have anticipated for the last several years since it first arrived uh, in North America in 2006, 2007. Um, but what I would appreciate being able to do is to just give you a little bit of background on our bats uh, and why they're important. Um, bats are mammals of the order Chiroptera. It's a word that means hand wing. They literally have a thumb and four fingers with skin membranes stretched between. They use that wing for flying, uh, but also for capturing insects. And uh, we've got two groups of bats throughout the world. The very large flying foxes, or fruit bats, which are known as the megachiroptera, and then the smaller insectivorous and echolocating bats, uh, which are the bats we have around here, the microchiroptera. So uh, out of about 1,200 species worldwide, we have um, about 50 different bats in North America, seven of those different species uh, reside in the summer months in Wisconsin, and three of those species leave for the winter, leaving four to hibernate here in Wisconsin and call Wisconsin home year round. Uh, overall, bats are an animal that are, uh, as a group, susceptible to decline for a number of reasons. As I mentioned, they're very long-lived. A uh, single bat in the wild here in Wisconsin can live 25 or 35 years. It only has one pup per year, and these animals are congregating in dense aggregations at critical phases during their life cycle. So in the summer, that might be someone's bat house or their attic uh, or cabin or a tree, and in the wintertime, that's a cave or a mine. And those caves and mines are critical. Bats cannot survive the long, cold winter months with no insect food available. So bats are valuable. As I mentioned, the micro bats that we have around here are insectivorous. They have an exclusive diet of insects, and it includes human health, mosquitoes, uh, forestry, the gypsy moth, and agricultural pests. And because of the threat of white nose syndrome, uh, USGS recently quantified the value of bats to Wisconsin agriculture. So we see that's a number in the millions, um, and specifically to Door County, it's over a over million dollars annually. 
the annual cycle for bats. Bats rely on these caves, uh, as I mentioned, to survive. There's simply no insects available for them to eat uh, during the fall, winter, and spring months. And if we look at the green wedge of the pie, we're during the summer roosting period. Right now, our bats are out uh, providing insect eating services for us each night. They're leaving their roost, going out to forage. Uh, the female bats are returning to the roost to nurse their pups, who will, they, who will fly a little bit later this summer. But then by August and into September, we will see those bats beginning to arrive at Horseshoe Bay Cave and some of the other 150 or so hibernation sites that we have in Wisconsin uh, to prep for winter. They do their mating in the fall. Then they go through six or seven months without eating and emerge in the spring to get pregnant, fly off, and roost. So we have a number of those critical aggregations uh, for bats. Just here in Door County, we have a number of important roost sites. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, Weckler Shelter at Peninsula State Park. It has several hundred bats. And we have a number of caves uh, for hibernation as well in this county. Horseshoe Bay Cave is important. It's the largest natural cave hibernaculum that we know of in Wisconsin. We do have mines that have larger groups of bats, but in terms of natural cave habitat, this is it, uh, with about 1,250 individuals. And those represent all four of our hibernating species. We'll go on to the next slide. We already went over some of these. Um, to give you a little bit of background on white nose syndrome and why it's causing devastation, why it's important, why we're concerned about it, uh, it's really wreaked havoc on the eastern half of North America since it arrived in North America in 2006. Uh, it first showed up in New York State and has spread rapidly since then, uh, as I mentioned, arriving in Wisconsin late this winter. And it's now in 25 states and five Canadian provinces. There are seven species of bats in North America that have been affected by this disease. And this is a concern because every disease, uh, excuse me, every hibernating bat that this disease comes in contact with uh, ends up susceptible to the disease. And what we've seen is that at any given hibernation site, when the disease arrives, we lose 75 to 95 percent or greater of the hibernating bat population within a two-year time period. So this has resulted in a 95% overall decline in bat populations in the eastern half of North America. Uh, it includes uh, the likelihood of regional extinction uh, for some of our most common bat species, including the little brown bat that most of you are familiar with because when you glance up in the summer sky in the evening, it's probably what you're seeing flying around. We have, as I mentioned, four hibernating species in Wisconsin. All four of our hibernating species are susceptible to white nose syndrome, as we've seen uh, it arrive in other states. So a map just showing the spread of this disease uh, from year to year, uh, arriving in Wisconsin, as I mentioned this year. But you can see the disease uh, is present in the UP in Michigan as well. So how is it spread? Clearly, bats uh, are animals that congregate. Uh, they are social, and they fly, and they fly far, so they are the ones spreading this disease. Uh, however, we also know that a cave environment, the sediment uh, and walls of that environment, can harbor the fungus, and that fungus can be carried out of the cave by bats, people, or gear, um, which leads us to believe, uh, and un operating under the precautionary principle, that humans may inadvertently pick up that fungus or fungal spores if they enter a cave and then spread it to another cave. So just a word again, uh, Horseshoe Bay Cave here in the middle of the circle houses bats that spread across the landscape for as far as 280 miles in summer months, returning each year to this cave. Uh, currently, the bats of Horseshoe Bay Cave are well within range of white nose syndrome. The bottom line is if you visit a cave, please don't transfer your clothing or gear. Keep it dedicated to that site. And if you're a person who visits caves on a routine basis, which is not most of us, uh, there's decontamination protocols that can be followed to make sure that you're not the one inadvertently spreading it. So our response here at DNR has been to learn as much about our bat populations as we possibly can while we still have time. We've been fortunate to see this disease coming. Uh, that's involved uh, working with private cave and mine landowners. We have about 150 hibernation sites throughout the state that we routinely monitor and have excellent partnerships with our landowners. 
uh, to be able to do that. We've also been working uh, with various research groups to try to learn as much as we can about this disease and prepare for its arrival. Uh, but it's also led us to list our four cave hibernating bat species as threatened in the state of Wisconsin. One of those species is proposed for federal listing. And we have a few laws that were enacted uh, related to the decontamination of gear uh, between caves and access for caves and mines. Thank you, Jennifer. So on to the management plan. And you've all received a copy on your, your Zoom. It's been posted of, of the management plan that was uh, adopted by the Airport Parks Committee and forwarded to you with recommendation of approval. And what I want to do is, is I want to just go right to the topics which are of, uh, of greatest interest as we've, as we've worked our way in greatest controversy and, and, and debate. The first and when we started that process in 2013, it was important if we're going to do a management plan, what is the goals? So th these are the goals that we established as we went forward. First one was to certainly, and they're not necessarily prioritized, they're just the four goals, was to protect and preserve the cave re resource. And the county acquired it, and it's also largely owned by another uh, landowners. It was to protect it and, and to preserve it. Then to enhance both the scientific and educational potential of the cave for the public. You've heard others say multi-use of the cave, and and they're probably quoting Grant and I because we were going to everyone and talking about the goal of multi-use of the cave. And certainly science and education is a real important part of it. And then it's access to, to offer opportunities for the public to be in, go into the cave and also improve the quality and safety of that, that experience. The cave has had many visitors over the years. I know some of you that are sitting in this room as kids went into it, including me, and we just sort of went in there and some of us had torches and we had all sorts of things going on in that cave. It's really to, to provide a somewhat more of a, a managed access. And then also to, to acknowledge and address the concerns and liability risks to the cave owners. That's both the county and the Horseshoe Bay Golf Course. So we, we started this project with these general concept and, concepts and, and refined them as we went along. All right. Jennifer talked about the management zones, and as she referred to those, those were based on multiple, cons multiple topics from science to the type of the cave and, and where the bats are. Well, then what we did is we also then, and she, where the bats are, this is the access restriction map, or access of availability, I should say, is it's, it's slightly different than than a management zone. And it's, it's, in, your, it's in your document, and, and we can also hand out some things that give greater idea. But what we did, and this came quite honestly from a suggestion from Gary Soule, was we, we extended the first access zone to the duck under that was referred to before. And so that, that first zone is part of management zone one and two, and that's the area of the cave where anyone with just reasonable mobility can go into the cave. Uh, you, okay, some people have to crawl, some crouch, some can even stand in, in, in places. But it goes to the duck under, which is a spot that gets muddy and at times floods out and it's got a ceiling about 24 inches or something of that sort. And that's right there. So that management zone, uh, we're proposing that that be the, the one with the least amount of restrictions. And I forget my numbers of how many, how many people we were talking about. Ten per, excuse me, we were talking about up to ten per week and groups of three to twelve. So it's really, really quite open with limited physical requirements. Almost anybody can go in there. You just want, have to want to go in. The next section, which is quite short, is from the duck, over, duck under to the, the wall room. And the reason it's segmented out is because it's this spot that at times people would have to go through water with only an inch of airspace, or at the other end of the spectrum it'll dry out and still at times maybe be a little bit muddy, but they can slide under there. It's a couple of foot ceiling. It's not a big deal. And it's still sediment and they can get to the, the wall room. We will largely manage up to the wall room the same restrictions and opportunity just given the wetness conditions of the duck under. 
So that's about 370 feet of the cave where there'll be quite open access to, to the uh, public. The next section is when we go from the, the wall, the, the duck under the wall room to what is known as the dining room, which is where you stop before you go through that crevice, the drop down the, and the pictures. That will be much more limited. We're talking about uh, up to five trips a year. And what's more important than the number of trips will be the, the amount of skill set that someone has to have and equipment. Uh, one of the items I think we need to stress is there's also flexibility that the director will have uh, based on other requests to do things beyond uh, anywhere beyond the wall room. After the dining room, it, we have no schedule in terms of access. It's really by, by request. And, and that's the area where the people need to be in, in very good shape, know what they're doing, have the right equipment, and most people, the vast majority of the people will not be in that section of the cave. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's totally a different animal. The way this is, is designed to work in the plan is what we call a trustee program. Uh, we will we'll make it available for people to be approved or certified to lead groups in there. So if you think about this first access zone all the way up to the 370 feet, a Boy Scout leader, 4-H um, leader, just you know anyone who has some reasonable responsibility and a little bit of skill set certainly can be certified to do that. Uh, almost almost anybody. They have the <coughs> expectation of taking care of the people and taking care of the cave. Then the trustee certification will increase as you go further in the cave. You know, if you go back in this area, you know that people like myself are not going to be trustees for going in that section of the cave, but someone like Jennifer could. It's, so trustee is available to the public. They can uh, demonstrate their ability and willingness, but it, it really will be the first 370 feet that most people uh, will want to be a trustee and go further into the cave. Okay, plan revision and cave modification. This is so important. This isn't a static document. The information is going to continue to come in in terms of science. I mean, we don't have white nose syndrome in the cave yet, but it's likely, if not expected, that it'll eventually be there. Uh, we have all these opportunities for people to come to the cave. I think, and I think some of the Parks Committee members pointed this out, we need to watch what the, the interest is for getting into the cave. If we have interest which doesn't fit well with the way we've set up management zones or certification, we need to be adjusting the cave as we go. Uh, and and we're, we're very sincere about that, that this document is going to change. I think Grant's the one that always talks about it being a living, living document. There is a process in the plan that allows for revisions and update and I have every expectation that that will happen sooner rather than later because none of us are, are that smart to get all this right the first time around. And we're going to get input. You've got some today and we're going to get a lot more as time goes on. The other is this cave modification. And, and what's important here is, is that the, the plan does not prohibit modification. And, and we use the word modification. We don't, you know, that it, there's a, there's a great interest in digging out the front section of the cave. But we group all modification uh, from putting in safety equipment somewhere in the cave by the crevices to modifying the cave to enhance habitat, modifying cave to, to have access. There's a process. But the process requires, and this is so important here, is the, the, the process requires of whoever is proposing whatever, they need to provide some, some science to back up that what they're proposing to do protects the resource. There's no one in this room, no one in this room, who can predict at this time what changing the floor or doing something would do to water movement, air movement, and bat habitat, and, and safety, and everything else. We're not at that point. So the de if you want to modify the cave, it's up to you to demonstrate a, a no harm. And 
it, it, it's, it'll be, uh, it certainly it'll be a challenge, but it, it's available. And that goes the same for, for the county and, and, and DNR if we have proposals in the future. Um, I think I hit all the main topics on that. So we'll just go back to Grant and Eric. So. I'll invite Grant first before I talk a little bit about the implementation. Oh, turn the lights back on because I guess I'll stand up because I'm used to doing that. Uh, one question that I anticipate you'll ask because it's been asked before, why in Hades did we go to all this trouble preparing a cave management plan if we don't own the vast majority of the cave and we have not been granted access to the vast majority of the cave. The simple answer is the owners, the Horseshoe Bay Golf Club, reasonably wants to know what the county's intentions are with respect to its use of the cave. Now that's a good segue. We are fortunate today to have Randy Rose from the Horseshoe Bay Golf Club present and I'm going to ask him to come up and make any comments he deems appropriate. He's also here, I believe, to answer questions, and that's the uh, sum and substance of my comment. Uh, assuming the cave management plan is adopted today, uh, we will then move forward to negotiate an access agreement with the golf club. Uh, we have allowed ourselves a fairly short window to do that, assuming the management plan gets adopted, that window being until about September. That access agreement will come back to this body for improve, approval. And after that, we will then start down the long road of uh, allowing public access, education, and science to take place within the cave. Eric, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, that's yeah, perfect. Please. Yeah, I'll touch on the implementation after Randy provides okay. some comments. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to meet with you today. I represent 33 owners of the Horseshoe Bay Country Club. I'm on 133rd as part of an LLC arrangement. We bought the club going back now three years ago from Glenn Timmerman, who many of you are familiar with. And Glenn and three partners had acquired the club as well as some other properties at Horseshoe Bay Farms from the Coles family. Now, by way of quick background, I'm a Green Bay boy, and I spent almost all of my summers here as I could when I wasn't working in Green Bay at the Coles Horseshoe Bay Farms. Um, I was in the Horseshoe Bay Cave when I was 14, and not to date myself, but that was somewhere around 1969. Um, with that said, the Horseshoe Bay Golf Club would like to be collaborative and cooperate with the county. And we think the management plan as it's currently constructed is a great starting point for further refinement as we look at the access plan and the arrangements. We also think that this has done a very good job of, of husbanding the resources that are in that cave I, among the other owners of the Horseshoe Bay Golf Club, bought the property with the expectation that we would keep it to the degree we possibly can in the way that the Coles family had put that together so that it wouldn't be overly developed. And the cave and the related area around the Horseshoe Bay Golf Club is something we would like to, to continue to see in its natural state or as close to its natural state as possible. With that said, I, I think we uh, have been quite collaborative with the scientific community, also with the stakeholders groups, and we certainly envision being collaborative going forward with the county, and we would uh, really advocate that the management plan as it's currently drafted go forward and be adopted. That would allow us to begin working on the access agreement. Our primary concerns uh, as the stakeholders for most of the CAVE, as you know, uh, the land rights would say we own everything up to heaven and down to hell. Below the surface is to preserve it, but our concerns are really about safety for whoever goes in there, appropriate access, and some kind of control so that uh, there isn't undue concern about people having incidents in that cave. And the related liability is also a big issue for us. Again, 33 of us put a good bit of what we had saved over time into that to try and preserve that property. So I just want to again thank you for the opportunity to speak. We'd advocate if you adopt this, then we would envision working very closely with Grant and Bill, Jennifer and others on uh, constructing an appropriate access plan. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to. Yes, sir. Uh, what about the private homes around the golf course? Uh, in, in what, what uh, regard? Well, you own the golf course. There are private homes located throughout the golf course, private land, which is also sitting on top of part of the cave system. 
Yes, it may be. This is one of the reasons that uh, we've agreed in principle with the county that we really should do a good job of radio mapping exactly where that cave goes. Not only to make certain that we've got the landowner rights uh, correctly identified, but also so that if there were, you know, uh, if someone wanted to dig a, a well for a new construction, at least we would know whether or not that would in some way uh, impact the cave. But what I guess I'm really getting at is this is the golf course that you're speaking for. You're not speaking on behalf of the remaining acre and a half lots plus that are there. You're correct. You're correct. We, we believe under the current map that we have that most of that is under the golf course, but we don't know that for a fact. That's one of the reasons that I think uh, an appropriate mapping really is one of the next steps. And has any landowners there put out any concerns about uh, this? Not activity? at this point, but uh, even just with the other 32 members of the LLC, as you might imagine, it's like herding cats. So that, 30, that group of 33 is in agreement in principle with the current management plan. And on that mapping, we, we've been working, actually working closely with a number of the cavers. We, we actually only disagree on some small points, and they're, they're an important part of that mapping project. And Grant and I and Randy and Eric and we're working with uh, a number of entities because there's, you can map a cave and it can be accurate as to the curves and movement in the cave, but what we really need to do is how that relates to parcel boundaries, and, and I, we'll make that happen. I think it's important for everyone. They it don't is. want to hurt the cave. We don't, you know, we need yeah. to understand. And in fact, we anticipate that it's likely to occur in the beginning part of September of this year. That's one of the first steps we're going to take. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that you represent one of the 33 stakeholders. Um, suppose uh, one or two of the stakeholders later on uh, do not go along with this plan. Does that kill the the whole plan from your side of it? I think part of this is just making certain that they truly understand what we've been uh, reviewing here. And that's part of the job I take back with me. But I, I can't guarantee that somebody might not raise their hand and say I have an objection. But does that kill the whole project then on your part? Or does it, is, it the, suspect, is it the majority? I, I suspect that it will be as always. Uh, we have an executive group. I'm a member of that group. So we, there's a small body of five of us that act on behalf. If the five individuals agree, which I think they will, they've agreed in principle to this point, and they'll be visiting the cave in July with Grant and Bill, I, I suspect we can then come to agreements on the access agreement. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Randy and thank Grant. You. Yeah. Um, Bill's going to just hand out a, a quick summary of the plan itself. Um, as you saw in the packet, I think it's 88 pages or so rather lengthy document and this is a nice overview that Jennifer and her staff at the DNR have helped to develop what um, with our input and kind of tweaking of this it's in draft form now as you'll see we're looking at um, having a publication like this available we could post on the county website and kind of use as we move forward to implement the plan um, granted that uh, the plan is approved um, this summer here what I wanted to point out is you receive the copy of this on page eight. Uh, the first six or seven pages really highlight some of the physical part of the cave that um, Jennifer included a lot of the pictures in her virtual tour. And on page um, eight, it gets into the phase implementation of the plan. And I just wanted to focus on that a little bit as we wind up the presentation. Um, obviously, phase one is the consideration of the approval of the management plan by the Door County Board today and then also um, approving the white nose bat syndrome prevention control plan that's incorporated into the management plan. Um, as Grant and Randy pointed out, our next step would be to transition into um, working out an access agreement with the Horseshoe Bay Golf Course later on the end of summer, early fall. We have that slated for September right now and Kind of hand in hand with that would go along with um, really trying to get some uh, radioactive mapping, I guess radioactive or radio, I should say, radio um, uh, basically location correlating the ground to the surface, as Bill mentioned, just to see how the cave itself, as it weaves through the, the rock, um, correlates with the boundaries um, up on the surface transitioning from the county ownership to the golf course and surrounding property. Um, and then as we move into this winter and spring into 2015, we would kind of move into phase three where we would uh, 
tackle a lot of the important parts of the plan, phasing in our um, trustee application program and trying to, uh, even as early as this fall, getting maybe some of the school groups, scout troops into the cave, the first, uh, first section of the cave in zone one. And moving on the next page into phase four would kind of be a year from now into next summer, we're anticipating um, to have all the zones um, kind of implemented at that point for access, whether it's with the trustee program through general access or else a special request that's part of the plan for a special uh, permit for any activities, research, and different things further back in the cave. And also um, different parts of the implementation would be exploring some different grants and avenues for um, dedicated equipment on at the cave itself. Um, a cave monitoring program. It certainly it's important as we talk about the living, breathing document to continue with the research and the science and just learning as much as we can about the cave as we um, phase into managing the, the cave um, with this plan and, and just uh, make sure our management guidelines are set up with the most current science behind that and information that we have. Hey, it's one thing I just want to add to that is is that um, even before we get to you know this fall, if we had a, a Boy Scout group or a 4-H group that wanted to go in at first 75 feet, we'd make that happen. So I think we've said that all along. We, it's that's doable. So, any questions for us? Go ahead, Don. Yes, this question is for Jennifer. Um, how concerned should we be, uh, suppose I or some individual was walking inside the cave uh, with a bat biting me? Well, um, I think one of the easy answers is that there's a time when bats use the cave and there's a time when they don't use the cave, um, at least not in any large numbers. So there is a small possibility that Solitary males will day roost in a cave during the, the time of year when you're going to see people accessing the site. Um, the likelihood of a bat-human encounter is low, um, given that situation and given the fact that the bats are asleep and they're asleep away from predators, so high up off the ceiling typically in those domed rooms so out of reach of visitors. Is it possible bats fly around in the cave? Yeah, the same way that they do if you're outside at night and they're swooping around your yard. Um, I? Less, and I think maybe what you're really getting at is there is a chance of a bat carrying rabies, correct? Right. Less than half of 1% of the wild population carries rabies. So are you going to have some anti-serum there or something or, <laughs> uh, in case a uh, bat bites me? Uh, I know some of these people are wishing for it, but uh, I'm just joking, of course. Yeah. Um, the is risk there is some antibiotic or something or something? That well, those of us that work with bats are pre-exposure rabies vaccinated. Um, it's a series of three shots, and actually the post-exposure vaccine has changed a lot since what maybe some of you have heard or, or remember from many years ago. It's, it's, again, a series of three shots. So if there were to be any type of incident with a scratch or a bite, um, I would expect that would be reported and dealt with at that time based on a person consulting with their physician. I assume that you have looked into this a little bit as far as the safety factor. Well, again, people and bats interacting in a cave in summer months is, is a low, there's a low possibility of that happening. <coughs> and I would say, you know, you're possibly more likely to have an encounter like that outside of a cave. Jennifer, because of I think the number one thing we can say is the summer. cave is closed, it will be closed for general access from during the time that the bats yeah. are hibernating in it. And that's, that's when the vast majority, and that time period is when, typically? So from October 1st through May 15th, there shouldn't be people accessing this cave because that's when the bats are using it. Then uh, my next question is to Grant, then. I assume that, and assume is a, a bad word, but uh, I assume that if somebody <coughs> would get bitten, 
that the county would be liable, correct? Uh, no. We have, uh, in the management plan, there is an access uh, agreement that uh, individuals who wish to go into the cave must read and execute. And persons going into the cave are uh, assuming responsibility for the risk of going into the cave. Uh, the likelihood of a bat uh, bite or bat bite by a rabid bat is probably the least of our concerns. But one of the uh, tasks that I have been given is to make sure that uh, people are aware of what the risks are when they go into the cave and that the county and Horseshoe Bay Golf Course be exonerated to the degree possible of any legal responsibility or liability. So. Okay. Thank you. That's actually, uh, Jennifer has brought some friends along if you'd like to see them. I think that Mark did. Susan had a question. I would like you to, uh, I'm referring to some of the comments that the public made. Right. And I'm assuming from what you guys have described is that what they're requesting is not an impossibility in the future, but you're not there yet in terms of knowing whether that's something to even consider. Would that be an No, I think that statement? that's fair. And, and it, I think I, I tried to make a point that none of us know the impacts of things that have been suggested and I, the responsibility is for those who want to do things. Um, Gary Sol and I have had wonderful debates and just before I came up here, I said it once again to Gary that we, we tend to agree on 99% of the things. It's just the timing of modification. And uh, we actually still talk and smile at each other, Gary, right? So I mean, it's just, but it's, it's a modification. It's possible, but there's a, there's a, there's a hurdle. And I, I don't want to understate that, you know, that responsibility is on the person who proposes. Dave? Uh, this also goes based on a uh, public comment. Uh, there was a comment about opening up general access to about 350, the first length of that, uh, at an elevation that would um, basically keep the upper part of the caves out of hand's reach, which to me basically implies nine feet, roughly speaking. Uh, I don't see how you could excavate down that depth without destroying an awful lot of material. And I would imagine the bottom of those cave sections must be tapered. So in order to accomplish that, what has anybody done any uh, preliminary investigation as to what those floor levels really look like at the I, bottom when they hit rock? I'll go back to Gary. I think Gary's dug a couple test pits in years ago, and we're in that 30 to 40 inch range in some places. Correct, Gary? I don't want to misspeak. All right. Um, in terms of um, you it would give more headroom in some places and for depending on your height, allow some people to actually stand. Uh, I gotta be, there's also a debate within the caving community and the science community. There's those who would want to just dig and take everything out just quickly. And then there's also the science of it and, and we can learn a lot from what's in that, in that sediment too. So, but like the duck under, uh, it's unlikely that there's six feet of uh, sediment there. Yeah, I went through that you know, yeah. myself when it was very dry. I was very lucky I was able to straddle the water. Um, but even 30 to 40 inches, that's 30 to, 4 inch, 30 to 40 inches somewhere, not necessarily two, three feet we wide. Have no, we do not, <coughs> right. So that would presume mean that if you did excavate to a workable level, that you'd have to remove rock also. Yeah, if, I guess if you said you're going to make it all for six foot four <coughs> folks, you likely would have Even to. Even if you uh, made it for right. Don's height, you know. <laughs> you, you, Don, you I have to do have that. A will. So. Yeah. I, there also was one comment that was made about access to the front of the cave, like, and we are we're looking into that. And Grant and Eric and I have been talking about uh, <clears throat> making, trying to come up with a method that people can get to the front of the cave easier. Uh, I'm convinced, quite honestly, that a lot of people will be satisfied by being able to get to the front of the cave and not much more. But we're working on some of the disability requirements and things of that sort, too. But we were, we were going to move a little faster. We have to slow down a little bit on that right now. Yeah, 300 and some odd feet would include the duck under, right? Yes, it would. Yeah. yeah. And also, we only own 70, 75 feet. So uh, the access agreement will, will undoubtedly, and you two can jump in if I say it wrong, will undoubtedly uh, give the 
golf course the ability to veto a mod modification proposed in their section of the cave. That's true. You know, I can't imagine anything other than that. So even if all of us wanted to do it, they still have to want it to. Chuck? Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, from early on when uh, Gary was talking that he was working with George on this, um, I was also somewhat involved in that, and I, and I support their efforts uh, to open it up to the public. But I guess at, at the same time, I mentioned this at our Airport and Parks Committee, uh, we are partnering with Horseshoe Bay Cave. We own 75 feet. Uh, the rest of the 3,000 feet is, is under their control, and it's important for us to remember that we have to honor, honor their requests and be thankful that we have a working relationship with them to be able to possibly, uh, we start out crawling and then we walk uh, to be able to get this done. And I think Chuck hit on something. We can't understate the significance of what has occurred in the last three, four, or five years. A rather significant natural cave, bat hibernaculum, has been transitioned, at least the entrance, from private ownership to public ownership, and it's going to be conser conserved and preserved and open for public access, whatever that might mean from this point forward forever. And it's the first time, if my understanding is correct, that's happened in Wisconsin in a very, very long time. Uh, I think it's also appropriate at this point in time to take the opportunity, and I know Bill and Eric would, would second me on this, uh, to acknowledge the golf club initially through the efforts of Glenn Timmerman and more recently through Randy Rose. Uh, cooperation with the county being a true partner in, in, in this and the fact that they are open to this is the only reason this has moved forward. And also with the DNR, uh, Jennifer and her cohorts have worked, uh, I think, above and beyond the call of duty in making sure that this plan moves forward. We had some stops and starts in the road, and this has taken longer than any of us have wanted to, but we're, I think, at the uh, cusp of something very significant, and we just have to make it over that last little hurdle, which is the access agreement. I, I would like, also like to just underscore one point, which is I think where we have absolutely a common uh, desire, which is in anticipation of successors at the county supervisory board level in the future and at the golf club ownership uh, in the future, to put a framework together such that it would uh, now continue past any term that might be where, you know, I'm in office at the golf club or any of you are at the supervisory level and envision something that's a long-term benefit to the parks uh, department here for the county. I just wanted to underscore that. That's part of why we're trying to really be, uh, I think, very deliberate in putting together these agreements so that it can uh, stand the test of time. Thank you. Thank you. John. Bill, there's a question that keeps coming up in my small mind. <laughs> uh, as we spend money, the taxpayers' money, to support our parks for public use and public enjoyment, I wonder in this instance, are we spending the taxpayers' money for the purpose of protecting some bats? I think we're spending money to protect the resource and have access to the cave for the public. I think it's both, John. I think, I think the, the unknown, and, and we should talk about this in two years, is will the public take advantage of this or not? I, I, I think like a lot of things, the county through the Parks Department is going to have to judge whether this is a resource that's worth putting additional money in in the future. You know, what if five people want to go in the cave in the next two years? It'd be kind of hard to sit in front of all of you and and ask for funds or authorization. So I think we're protecting the resource and public access. It's both. But I don't know. I don't know. We were either one of those are going. We're going to have white nose syndrome. We're going to have uh, issues of that. And there's people in this room that claim we can have 10,000 people show up in a in a year. You know, um, I'm not one of them. So we'll just judge where where that goes. How's that for walking the line, John? Pretty good job. Thank you. <laughs> Do you know how much money we're to wind up sticking into this project? Well, uh, to this point, it's been largely staff time, and quite honestly, a lot of outside normal hours by a lot of different people. Uh, there was a grant. There is uh, 
Mike Tony's represents, I believe he's on the Friends Group, the Parks Friends Group? Um, or not? not on the Friends okay, group, group, but with the school. With the school. The There's, well, I should be, Eric should yeah. be talking. There's the Friends Group <laughs> that's offered some money and yeah. such, so I'll let Eric do that. Yeah, our uh, Friends of the Door County Parks Group has offered $2,000 to help kind of get it off the ground, uh, kickstart our uh, dedicated equipment for the cave. Um, obviously, with the importance of the white nose bat syndrome to have equipment that's not used in other caves and, and kept here. Um, certainly, we would look into some different grant sources if we wanted to try to get more equipment and things like that. Um, I think ideally, if uh, if I can make things happen, you know, we've run a tree planting program for years, and the SWCD has four tree planters. And we run that program on a fee-funded uh, method. And what we've talked about is potentially if this equipment could be rentable fee, and that would be a self-supporting system. That's how ideally it would work. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not foolish. We know we're not going to get a bunch of money in the next budget for the horseshoe they pay. Mm -hmm. All right, that was 10 minutes, Dan. <laughs> Thank you. Are we seeing the pets? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll make this quick because I value your time, but we do have some education animals um, that we use with our DNR programs, and I wanted you to have the opportunity uh, to see this rather mysterious animal that we don't often get to see up close. Um, and I'm just going to let her calm down for a minute because I just woke her up. Um, I have a big brown bat today representing the microcoraptorans or insect eaters and echolocators. I've also got uh, a larger bat with me. And the big one's going to pick she you up. talking to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here. She's not echolocating right now, but she's making a chatter or distress call. Because, again, I woke her up. She sees Grant standing there. <laughs> uh, this is a big brown bat. It's one of our most common species. If you've ever had a bat in your house, oh, you've yes. got probably this bat. Um, mm -hmm. And, again, I mentioned... I mentioned we have these in Horseshoe Bay Cave, um, but of course they're throughout the state. And it's a hardier species that can tolerate colder, drier conditions, uh, perhaps in some of our other species. I love it. I think they're growing. <coughs> so this is a beetle specialist. Uh, it's a bat that uses low frequency acoustic call that night that travel far and forages in open spaces. On a, on a night, what's their range? So this bat will range from a mile to five miles from its neighbors in the summer months. And pregnant and lactating females will eat up to their body weight. Uh, Get that thing away from me. Look at you. That's a big one. A thousand mosquito sized insects per hour. Pick you up. So they're actively I'll probably end up with last year. Which is okay. Oh, you know, it's a big bit of 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 a we need six thousand mosquitoes per hour. Yeah. Ain't doing a very good job up here. Over there. Second bat that I have is a bat that um, is not native to Wisconsin, and we have this bat because it's easier to see because it's bigger. <laughs> this is one of the largest bats we have in the state, by the way. The big brown. I've heard that before. The other bat um, is a fruit bat native to Africa. It's called a straw-colored blind box or a straw-colored fruit bat. Uh, so a little bit bigger, a little bit easier to see. Um, this is a male, okay? He's 13 years old. He was born in captivity uh, in relatively overcrowded conditions. 
Um, you're seeing his thumb here at the, the end of his wing. So again, thumb, four fingers. Uh, these bats are very agile. Their wing is used like a hand. They hook their thumbs on things to climb. You did say that the males are the ones that attack, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fruit? This is a fruit bat. We're flying a fox. Yeah. So this is a bat that does not use echolocation. It's got a long nose, similar to a dog, large eyes. Bats can see well in that line. Like in Africa, in Africa um, anything, again, they're opportunists, right? So flowers, nectar, bark, leaves but also whatever fruit is right. And these bats will gather uh, in trees to sleep during the daytime in groups in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, they have an annual migration where they gather a million. <laughs> Nature program to get, to get birth. So they'll move across the landscape. Sometimes the baby drops down. How long do they live? This bat will live 15 to 20 years in the wild. So you've got a wild <laughs> He's coming. He's going to come and get you tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We used to have bar baths on the farm. You know, when you were talking about Here, could be. Grace of Peach is waiting for mosquitoes. He's got to put a dent into it. What is he eating beside mosquitoes? Oh, shit. Yeah. 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 But that's just the end of the line. So let me just stop the end of the line. I'm talking about actually. That one from Africa. Okay. 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 Is he been trying to bite you? He's using his mouth to grab the mouth. So you can help him with Terry's tongue. Um, <laughs> got so many layers. <laughs> oh man, yeah. It's, that's the hard part. Is it's actually, you don't want to get everything because then it's overwhelming. But it's, you know, at the same time, you don't want to miss it. And you know, it's it's kind of like I know Eric does a good job. You know, just kind of taking notes as you go, talking to him and stuff. And, you know, that's a thing. If you don't get votes taken, that'll be a whole separate thing. Did you club? It's kind of setting up the issue and yeah. what they decide. So. I did radio news. Okay. I was tired. Yeah. 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 Can you come back up? <laughs> He's gone from the paper. I'm still here. <laughs> That's great, man. It's good to know. There's some value for our services. Well, we got Barb telling us to get the hell off. <laughs> you ready, ready? Wait. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah, that was very interesting. We're going to go to resolution 2014-59, approval of the Horseshoe Bay Cave Management Plan. Someone make a motion. I'll make a motion to. Support. Motion by Chuck, seconded by Biz. Has anybody got any questions? <laughs> that was really interesting. Yes. It was. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. That is passed unanimously. Um. Bill Schuster, you might just well come right back up here. Mm -hmm. The next item is the uh, 2014-56 uh, resolution for uh, Sister City in China to form an ad hoc informal advisory group of a number of people. Could I have a motion to approve that so then Bill will explain what he plans on doing? So, uh, Susan, is there a second? David? Go ahead, Bill. Tell us what your plan is, our plan, or sure. Um, as we talked last time I was here, Dan asked Bill Shooter and myself to work on the whole Jensen Sister City relationship to explore whether it can be ex made successful and, and made into a real Sister City relationship. And we've had we have several fronts that we're working on, and actually some really positive things. But one of the one of the items that when Shooter and I would talk would be that we really ought to have county board representation at, at these meetings. 
And I, I talked to Dan about it, and Dan was supportive of it. And what I did is I contacted the four members who are listed in the resolution, whether they'd be willing to, to serve on the, on the ad hoc committee. Uh, because of interest they've expressed in past, all four said yes, and we don't have a budget, so it includes that there isn't any money for per diem or expenses. So that was one of the conditions. It really is to provide that liaison between the county board and, and the ad hoc committee. I think what we want to do is uh, the agreement comes up next June. June? Next, 2015. Next, this June or next June? Next, next 2015. 2015, and we want to find out if it should continue or not continue, very simplistic. And that's what the advisory group is going to come back and tell us the benefits to Door County to have that agreement. Mm -hmm. Does anybody got any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That has passed. Um, statement of project intentions, Door County Airport. Um, Biz, you're on the hook for that, I guess. <clears throat> Yeah, in resolution 2014-57, statement of project intention for the Cherryland Airport. <clears throat> I'd turn it over to Keith, but I, he isn't here. But uh, this is a six-year statement of the project intentions uh, used by the Department of Transportation, Bureau of Aeronautics for planning and budgeting purposes and is not a petition for federal and state aid. Uh, there's no, uh, according to Shirley, there's there's no fiscal impact at this time. This is, uh, you know, the project intention over the next six years. So I'd make a motion that we approve resolution 2014-57 uh, statement of project intentions. Uh, at this time, I'll okay. make that motion. Okay, seconded by Joel Gunlickson. Are there any questions? I think we do this every year, don't we? Every two years. Six. Is there any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is passed. Um, next one is a petition of Secretary of Transportation for Airport Improvements uh, of the Door County Cherryland Airport. Um, go ahead, Biz. I'll make a motion that we approve resolution 2014-58 uh, petitioning the Secretary of Transportation for Airport Improvement Aid by Door County uh, Cherryland Airport, Door County, Wisconsin. Is there a second? Seconded by Joel Gunnickson. Um, does anybody have any questions on this? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is passed. Uh, next item is the proceed with the Cane Island Preservation Rehabilitation Re Restoration Project. Uh, Go ahead, Biz. You want Eric? I think he's still here. He? Yeah, th this 2014-60 uh, mm -hmm. is approval to proceed with the Cane Island Preservation Re Rehabilitation Restoration Project. And it is uh, subject to having the monies. Uh, there's grant money involved in this uh, from a couple of different sources. And the Maritime Museum is, is uh, reassuring or, or uh, checking into making sure that the money is there for this project because the project is not in whole. It doesn't uh, include the interior part. It's, it's the exterior part of uh, the Cane Island Lighthouse and the, the Keeper's House and other buildings that are up there. And there's uh, supporting documentation in here about uh, the bids and uh, they're saying that we have enough money, but they are at this time making sure that the grant money is still there for just the exterior part, and it's subject to that. So if we approve this, and it turns out something happens that the money is not there, uh, then, then we'd, there'd be another problem. So the, the, the money has to be there. Okay, does anybody have any questions on that? Richard, why do we, why do we need a resolution for that? Um, to proceed, because you're signing a contract for uh, money involved uh, to proceed with a, it's a bid project and it might, Grant it, can answer that. Isn't it like three quarters of the underway anyway? Yeah. No, they have not started on the rehab, no. no. Go ahead, Grant. No, uh, very quickly, as quickly as an attorney can, uh, <laughs> this uh, project was put out to bids uh, 
on two, <coughs> recently on two separate occasions. Uh, the bids came back higher than expected. Uh, the decision was made uh, and recommendations made and adopted by the Airport and Parks Committee to proceed with uh, part of the project, that being the exterior of the structures. Uh, and because we've gone through that bid process and we have bidders that have uh, put forward qualifying bids that uh, can be accepted, <clears throat> we need a resolution uh, authorizing the project to proceed and authorizing the execution of those contracts and the prosecution of the work, but it's all contingent upon the money being available. And I think as is previously stated, uh, the Maritime Museum is going to go out to the donors to make sure that they are comfortable with the fact that less than the full project is uh, going to be done at this time with the dollars that they had uh, donated or gifted or uh, what, whatever term you want to use uh, to the project. And we anticipate that will be a relatively brief uh, process. And uh, if, in fact, all the donors and the people that made gifts and pledges indicate that they are uh, fine with the project going forward, uh, or part of the project going forward, then the project will proceed. Okay, is there any questions on this? Go ahead. Uh, I, I guess one thing to, uh, that was interesting, the way that the bids were constructed, I, I guess it was to try to encourage some local contractors to be able to come in and do some work on this. And the surprising thing was we didn't even get any bids locally. Uh, so I, I guess the locals, unless they were asleep at the stick, uh, didn't even throw in a bid. Greg. Hmm. Any other questions? If not, oh, go ahead. I could just highlight that a little bit because I did talk to one of the contractors about something, and they, I don't think they were aware that they could even get to it. They thought they had to take a boat or something like that to, you know, to okay to do whatever. So that might be a reason that they got a little gun shy on. I'm doing it because, and the bid did come in a little bit higher than anticipated, correct? Yeah. So the the committee made a decision to save the outside and work on the inside at a future date when more money is available, correct? That's yeah. that's the main reason for splitting it up into <coughs> two uh, areas, Good. correct? Any other questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. That is passed. Uh, next item. Uh, is the door? Uh, let me see who who, who second that. Somebody. I don't think I was going to say I don't think there was a second. I don't but think being, there was. I will second it. If okay, there's not. Your team. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Next item is the Door County Pay Philosophy. Um, you have in your packet or on your Zoom a, a number of charts. Um, basically, you want to exclude those charts from because uh, they're speculative and uh, the charts become more uh, perfect when we get into the budget procedure. Um, Maureen or David or somebody want to explain the pay philosophy? Maureen, you want to take a shot at it first? Or? Sure, and we also do have Kelly Hendy. Kelly Hendy, yeah. Uh, HR director. Let's Kelly? Get a motion. Can we make a motion on the floor so we can discuss? I'll make motion, a motion by Dave, sure. seconded by... Who wants to second it? Roy Engelbert. Go ahead, Dale. Kelly, go ahead. Kelly's going to come up to the mic. The, the charts that we're talking about are on page 144 of 151, or page 7, depending upon if you have a printed copy or not. It's the chart called Annual Merit Increase Considerations. That's going to be referred back to committee. Am I correct about that? Okay. And the other uh, items that are being referred back to committee are page 147 of 151 through... <coughs> Uh, 151 of 151, the pay grades, that'll be referred back to committee as well. Am I correct about that? Correct. Right. Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, that's correct. But the, re back the to remaining... Administrative committee. Yes. Right. Yes. The remaining part of this is the pay philosophy in general. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning. I am going to walk through just some of the highlights of the pay philosophy and what um, the management team in collaboration with the administrative committee put together here. So some of the highlights that are incorporated into the pay philosophy 
are that Door County's pay philosophy is to meet the market. Pay increases criteria are a combination of steps and merit. And pay grade changes are done through promotion, reclassification, and reallocation. On page 138, the philosophy starts, and the core of the philosophy, or the <coughs> framework, is to recognize the value of each position and employee that brings to Door County. Pay salaries that are equitable for work being performed. <coughs> pay salaries consistent with external market rate. Striving for an average to meet the market. Be equitable and pay across departmental lines. Attract and retain fully qualified employees. Increase employees' understanding of pay administration. And increase manager accountability for administering pay. The next page, page two, walks you through job documentation, which talks about how to maintain a job description and work through those with changes and whose responsibility they are and how they need to be updated for new positions, revised jobs, and vacant jobs. The next section talks about job pricing and salary range structure. And in our compensation study, we know our comparable counties were Marinette, Oconto, and Wapaka. And it also walks through the process of the Human Resources Director and pay movement. Then it walks through the salary range structure, the min, the mid, and the max. And if I'm going too fast, you can stop me. Pay adjustments and how those are done. And then general guidelines and definitions of the different job classes, promotions, job reclassifications, and such. Any questions? Anybody got any questions? Okay. If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That has passed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any oral committee reports? Anybody have anything on uh, the committee minutes? Anybody have any questions about committee minutes? Uh, review of vouchers, claims, and bills. I think we tired them out. <laughs> uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, First on the Ralph Smith video, that was done by uh, Laddie Chapman, the program director of Sevastopol, uh, the town of Sevastopol. And it's on channel 986, is it? Uh, you got PEG. It's on 986 occasionally, but it's on YouTube always. Oh, YouTube. Uh, so uh, when you read it, uh, see it, rather, you give credit to uh, Laddie for putting it together. If you're going to go to the conference um, in uh, September to the Wisconsin Dells, uh, see Jill no later than uh, July 15th. And one of the questions sh she should ask you, a reminder to ask her, is whether everybody wants to participate in getting a polo shirt such as this and uh, at your own expense. Um, so, and then the county board was originally scheduled for uh, the 22nd of July. Um, Shirley very much appreciates it that we move it to the 29th because that day we're going to be voting on the CIP and she wants more time okay. to get it all put together. Uh, does anybody have any objections to it? Uh, any? If not? Uh, I have no objections because I'll be bringing the uh, donuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> Motion to adjourn. So moved. So Wait, this has a question. Yeah, under announcements, I just want to say that it, as everybody uh, knows, the the emerald ash borer bug, you know, has been identified in Door County in a couple of spots, and 
you know, it's already 12 noon, and, and you probably have time for a little lunch break, but there's going to be an educational seminar uh, or educational meeting out at Crossroads uh, in one hour from now, at 1 o'clock, from 1 to 3. Uh, the DNR, the Soil and Water Department, and, and others are going to be there, and they're going to explain uh, a lot about the Emerald Ash Board, some education, and what some of Door County's options are now that it's identified in Door County because we, according to the newspapers, we're under quarantine already. So, I, I you know I'm suggesting that if you really want to know a lot about Emerald Ash Borer and, and what it's all about and what our options are going to be for Door County, uh, about an hour from now, one until uh, three o'clock is going to be education. And the administrator told me that it's going to be videoed. Lanny Chapman's going to be heading out there. He's going to videotape this and get it on the PEG channel. So people that cannot be at the meeting, that they're going to get some education on uh, what this is all about. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very important issue. Thank you. OK. John. Are these a thing of the past? No. Um, we had some technical difficulties, so they're not a thing of the past. Same one was last month? Technical difficulties? No, last it's month? my technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Don't move. Motion Second. to adjourn. Okay, you got it. All in favor say aye. 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 Hey, really, you're out of today.